Hello everyone. I welcome you all to the final day of uh, IRDC 2022. And today we have five teams who will be presenting their designs to us. And past two days has been fantastic. And we expect the same kind of uh, designs and results from the teams. Uh, and let's see how it goes today. And the first team which we have today is uh, Team RoverX. And in fact, they are the current champions. And this is their third IRDC. And uh, yeah, hello guys. Am I audible to you all? Team RoverX? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, before we proceed with the presentation, let me remind you the guidelines. So you will have 16 minutes to present your design. After that, we'll move to the Q&A session. And uh, during the presentation, only four of you can speak. And during Q&A, all 10 of you can uh, speak and uh, answer to a particular question. So yeah, whenever you're ready, you can uh, uh, share your presentation. Sure, just give me a, uh, sir, uh, it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, I just uh, enabling that. Wait. Okay, now you can. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to confirm, is my screen visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Good evening. We are Team RoverX. We are a group of 21 undergraduate students from the Velour Institute of Technology, VIT Velour, Tamil Nadu, India. We're passionate about space exploration and robotics. We're a highly multidisciplinary team with members categorized into five major subsystems, electrical, mechanical, computer science, autonomous, astrobiology, and life sciences, and the research and de development department. We would like to first begin by defining the purpose of this mission, as without a clear purpose or goal, engineering a system is just a futile effort. Over the past 15 years, our understanding of the Martian polar region has been greatly advanced by the analysis of data acquired by a small armada of orbiting spacecraft. Amongst the two poles, the southern pole is of greater interest as it houses the largest body of water ice near the surface, which might be essential in determining the presence of extraterrestrial life. Furthermore, deposition spanning over billions of years has led to the formation of subsurface layers that have recorded the geological and climatic history of Mars. However, there is only so much that we can infer through satellite and aerial data. Hence, these aspects prompt us to go to the surface and carry out an in-depth analysis of the region to lay a foundation for future missions. With our vision defined, we then began brainstorming various approaches to this mission. We first considered a rover plus drone-based approach, comprising a surface rover for analysis and an aerial drone for terrain mapping and site selection. However, we ran into several issues with this approach. Firstly, the strict weight limitations of drones meant that integrating the various instruments such as LIDARs, hyperspectral cameras, visual and thermal cameras, etc., was very difficult while staying under the weight limit. Furthermore, even if the weight was under control, the power limitations on both the drones meant that we couldn't run multiple instruments at once. The drone-based approach also had physical constraints. The drone was simply too big to somehow dock or fit inside the rover. Lastly, we found the system to lack redundancy despite having a high chance of failure. If a single instrument on board the drone fails, the entire mission could be compromised. The second approach we took solved a few issues with the first, a surface rover with a tethered balloon for mapping and site selection. This approach was ideal for communications as it maintained direct line of sight. It also had lower power limitations due to it being tethered. Weight constraints still existed just to a lower extent than with drones. The main issue we faced with this approach was the inertial effects of the balloon and the stability. With very high wind speeds, we would have to implement thrusters into the balloon, which would introduce unnecessary complexity and consumables into the mission. We finally came up with an approach comprising of one main rover responsible for uh, carrying out in-depth science analysis, sample caching, communications, and charging of the extreme rovers, and five extreme rovers responsible for traversing ahead of the main rover and mapping, path planning, site selection, and aerobiological analysis. Each of these rovers are fitted with instruments specific to their responsibilities, which will be discussed in great detail in a later part of this presentation. Through satellite images, research papers, and MRO data, the foothills and layered regions of Panam Austral were analyzed, and the three cross one kilometer region comprising the three regions of interest, namely soil, ice, and soilized boundary region, was defined. Five extreme rovers traverse ahead of the main rover, addressing the terrain and gathering data from the potential site. Once the site is selected as denoted by the orange dot, all the rovers rendezvous at that particular site. The main rover conducts scientific analysis at the site and the extreme rovers get docked to the main rover for battery charging. 
This site then acts as the origin for the next citation. While the extreme rover travels forward, the main rover communicates the result of scientific analysis back to the base station. Scientific analysis and battery charging takes place at the site for this particular iteration. Our region is explored through 12 such cyclic iterations, each covering a semicircular region of 300 meter radius. Stage one of the mission starts from the center of the edge of three cross one region. The main rover drops the communication node at starting of the iteration and begins with the scientific analysis of the origin site. The extreme rover starts traversing according to the breadth per search algorithm, followed by parallel search pattern. After the extreme rover, the 300 meters radially away from the cycle origin, stage two begins with the extreme rover's while drop a node and communicate back the raw LiDAR data to the main rover. Parallelly, the extreme rovers communicate the preferred site in the region which they have individually explored based on data from gas sensors, hyperspectral imaging, thermal imaging, and LiDAR point cloud map. Now, the preferred site, along with their specific uh, characteristic data points and time stamp, is communicated back to the main rover. The main rover then stitches the LiDAR point cloud data received from the five extreme rovers and creates an overall map of the entire explored region for this particular cycle. The main rover then calculates which site out of these five preferred sites is best to conduct scientific analysis, considering it has the shortest, safest, and direct path for its easy traversal. The main rover communicates the selected site along with the staged map to the, the extreme rovers, enabling them to directly move to the site. Stage three begins when all the rovers reach the selected site and dock together for charging of the extreme rovers, while the main rover performs in-depth surface, subsurface, and a biological analysis along with atmospheric and environmental analysis. At the end of the site analysis, this site marks as the origin for the next iteration. The main rover communicates the results of scientific analysis along with system health report back to the base station using the wireless mesh nodes. We will now begin by explaining our core systems. We'll start with power. For power, the primary source of power is an advanced Stirling radioisotope generator. Uh, as it generates power through a three-step energy conversion, converting heat from radioisotope decay into mechanical oscillations and then into electrical power. At ASRG was chosen as it is reliable and provides continuous electrical power independent of environmental factors. And ASRG was chosen over MMRTGs or SRGs due to its significantly higher thermal electric conversion efficiency as shown by the graph above. Power is also, the ASRG is also complemented by a lithium ion battery pack on board the main rover that provides power when requirements temporarily exceed the ASRG's output and the energy from the main rover's battery pack is used to quickly charge the extreme rovers. A similar 6S2P battery pack is the primary source of power for these extreme rovers. A rover has an equal function effectively depends greatly on the material choice. The material selection was carried out by defining application requirements and considering the environmental condition of planum austere. The shortlisted materials were assessed on a matrix of physical properties as shown in the figure. Coming to the chassis. The chassis is a double layer space frame structure designed to equally distribute and support the loads. A CFRP structure around the space frame chassis protects the house electronics from radiation and the low temperatures of planar mosquito. A static structure simulation was carried out on the space frame structure to analyze its stress distribution and deformation. Now coming to the suspension system. The suspension of the rover is a hybrid, hybrid track-like active suspension. Compared to a static suspension, the four independently controlled series articulated legs with five degrees of freedom help achieve mobility over a broad set of terrain topology. The rover is capable of traversing in two modes, the track drive mode and the alternating tetrapod mode. In the track drive mode, the rover engages its track drive for quick traversal. In the alternating tetrapod mode, the rover engages its active suspension and enables traversal over rugged terrain through alterations in the leg configuration. The next system is the continuous track drive system. The track drive system at the end of each leg provides a large contact area with the ground, preventing damage to the brittle dry ice surface of the mission area. Calculations were carried out to find the optimum contact area with the brittle dry ice, which proved the contact area of a wheel to be insufficient. The, track, the treads of the track enable the escape of sublimated ice, thus preventing the ride and frost effect. The rovers are getting localized by using the data collected from IMUs, VLA encoders, visual hyperspectral imaging using unscented thermal filter. The extreme rovers use LiDAR, laser sensors, and stereo camera to collect information about the terrain. To filter out discrepancies in the point cloud caused due to suspended dust particulates, we use the same CNN-based architecture to label and define point cloud data points, allowing removal of dust points. Then it goes under pre-processing, which involves removal of outliers, smoothing of data points, filtering of noise, and removal of body points. Following next, data undergoes point cloud segmentation for obstacle detection and the cost map is updated with traversable nodes and intraversible nodes for obstacles using the laser sensor data. 
The obstacles are classified using the risk assessment module and thus drive control of the rover is chosen. The control drive of the rover switches between track drive mode and alternating tetrapod mode depending upon the risk assessment module. The input parameters for this module were based and tested upon the mechanical factors such as ground clearance, approach, and attack angle of the tractors. If risk assessment module defines an obstacle to be avoided, then a modified morphine algorithm which integrates harmony search takes over and optimizes the path for the updated cost map according to the obstacle level. At the same time, all the data being collected by the extreme rovers is being stored for future users as well. On reaching a distance of 300 meters from the starting point, the extreme rovers send back the complete LiDAR data and the preferred site selected by them, along with the characteristic data of the site, that is thermal map, HSI, and gas sensor data. On receiving the LiDAR point cloud from five different extreme rovers, the main rover undergoes resampling via trained deep graph neural networks to counter any lo losses and spread caused due to wireless communication. Before stitching the point cloud data, it undergoes RG smoothing, we use visual hyperspectral imaging data combined with IMU and VLAN encoders to showcase the point cloud on the egocentric map, where the field of view of the LiDAR is used to establish common overlapping area, which is used to align the point clouds collected by the different rovers, thus allowing us to stitch the uh, point cloud data through DB scans. Once the point cloud is stitched, it undergoes same pre-processing as the extreme rover to label each point cloud data point as traversable or intraversible node on the cost map. The intraversible node clusters are grouped and classified into obstacles using the laser sensor data. Now, this complete map of the region, along with the positioning system established by the wireless mesh nodes, works as a global map for the rovers. Main rovers decide the best site among the preferred ones and share that location along with the complete global map with the extreme rovers. The D-Star light algorithm is used to form a path between the starting point and the selected site. For global mapping, A-Star and D-Star light algorithms were considered. Among these, D-Star light algorithm was chosen as it offers less computational cost and the paths were more optimized to the parameters used, that is, shortness and smoothness with a high convergence rate. These paths to the selected site are then passed on to the meta heuristic genetic algorithm, which assesses them on the safety factors such as roughness, slope, drop, etc., and gives us a path which is safe or smooth enough to allow the rover to majorly travel in track drive mode, thus making minimal use of the active suspensions. We have considered most of the problems that a communication system will face in that unexplored C cross one region with irregular hilly terrain. First, the signal will degrade and will potentially be lost if the distance is too large. Second, the propagation channel may be frequency selective. Third, radiation interference and noise due to cosmic and solar rays. We explored various solutions, including underground wireless communication channel. However, the region is comprised of irregular patches of soil and ice boundaries, hence a common wireless communication system can't be established for these topographies as it would require hardware modifications of the antenna during runtime. The MRO could have been used for communication if it had longer coverage time, constant environmental factors, that is radiation pattern and wind speed, at the transmitting end and high data rate. None of these factors can be achieved using MRO. To elaborate, first, the radiation environment to be found on Mars South Pole due to galactic cosmic rays, GCR, and solar particle events, SPE, is highly dynamic with respect to time because poles are more exposed to the sun. Second, MRO is only available to us for 4.76 minutes every two hours, which is not feasible to transfer the very critical LIDAR point cloud of the entire region, as well as the scientific data of the selected sites. Given MRO has a very low data rate of 300 kbps using 720 dBm of power, and that too with a loss of more than 60%. That is why we can't rely on the MRO for interover communication. For the unexplored region after the starting point, we developed a self-calibrating wireless mesh communication system, which is easily deployable, self-repairing, and a multi-hop system for interover communication and is independent of the MRO. First step towards the development of such system is to estimate the environment and consider the radiation losses. Factors taken into account are terrain irregularity, surface permittivity, conductivity, and refractivity, as well as the radiation pattern. The mesh is established by dropping communication nodes from the rovers at instances earlier explained in the cycle plan and at places of high radiation and substantial terrain variations based on the data retrieved from the extreme rovers. As some of the nodes will not be in line of sight due to uneven and unpredictable terrain, an omnidirectional, circularly polarized antenna has been designed to overcome uncontrolled reflections and to energize the entire region for the mesh network. To consider the multipath and interference, including intersymbol interference, porosity of the Martian subsurface soil layers has been taken into account. To adapt the variations in terrain, the LiDAR data from the rover will be used before deployment of the nodes, based on which the frequency of communication channels will be selected. A robotic arm has six degrees of freedom with harmony drive reduction, chosen for its high torque capacity, excellent collision accuracy, low backlash, and high torsion resistance. The joints on the arm are actuated by BLDC, all, uh, BLDC in all encoder feedback, which are primarily chosen due to the uh, platform factors, high torque density, and smooth response time. The ARM has three modular, uh, modular software and effectors, namely IMR Pro, Surface Preparation Module, and Drilling Module. 
The AMR probe is non destructive and consists of imaging probe which uses NIR, visual, and UVC lights, a Raman spectrometer, and an MTP probe which analyzes the physical properties, mineral composition, and the presence of biosignatures in the coming surface. The surface separation module is used to remove the layer of dust if required in order for the rover to perform various scientific analysis. The drilling module consists of 36 core drill bits which can drill and cast the samples into the parasol on board the rover with minimal cross contamination. An FTI gas analyzer is present on board the rover, which can analyze the atmospheric composition and even detect the presence of bioaerosols and noble gases. The subsurface analysis is done with a custom made module that can collect both low resolution data up to 500 meters in depth and high resolution data up to 50 meters depth at the same time, which gives us the layer and middle profile of the land. Aerobiology is done with the help of two systems, namely the aerocache, which collects and stores samples by trapping, by trapping suspended particles in the air, and an aerotube. Which, uh, which can constantly analyze the airborne particles by observing the scattering absorbance of fluorescence of light. This information is then used to estimate the size and the properties of the particle. We also have a set of sensors which continuously monitor the environmental parameters like humidity, pressure, wind speed, radiation, temperature, and seismic activity, which can later be used to determine the habitability of the region. Site selection is performed with the help of gas sensors and the SR system, which is made up of hyperspectral camera and thermal camera, which, gives, which makes thermal and lithographic maps, respectively. Thus, to summarize the science plan, the surface analysis of mineral composition is performed by the imaging probe, a Raman spectrometer, and a hyperspectral camera. In the same way, the analysis for live detection is done with an imaging probe, a Raman spectrometer, FTI, and thermal camera. The mineral composition and the live determination analysis for the suspended particles in the air are carried out using the aero cache and air tube. The subsurface mineral composition is analyzed using a custom made subsurface module, which can later be used along with the data of the FTI to determine the presence of subsurface life. All the data regarding the terrain topography, mineral composition, subsurface layer profile, dynamic weather condition, atmospheric composition, soil quality, and the presence of biosignatures are analyzed in order to determine the suitability of the region to harbor life. With this, we would like to conclude our presentation, and we are open to any and all questions that you might have. So, that was a good presentation. Uh, now, judges. Uh, th thank you. It was a nice presentation, Team Redex. I really like your ideas, what you have presented. I do have a couple of questions to you. Am I audible, right? Yes, sir. Uh, so the first one is regarding uh, the, the, the semicircular patch that you have uh, suggested. So any particular reason for going with semicircular patch? Because I suppose there will be multiple overlap in the region. You will be traversing the same region multiple times. So any particular motivation by uh, for selecting this semicircular patch? Good evening, sir. I would like to take this question. So the semicircular patch was taken so that it instigates, like it helps us move along the length of the three cross one region. Also, uh, the area overlap between two semicircles was minimized by the help of the five rovers. Uh, many basic mathematical calculations were done, and uh, it was therefore concluded that using of five extreme rovers was the best at, at it, as it reduced the overlap area to 33%. If the, if the number of extreme rovers were changed, it could have uh, increased the overlap area up to 54%, making our uh, uh, cycle plan uh, algorithm inefficient. But uh, what the search pattern offers is, uh, but, but the efficiency offered by our search pattern is uh, actually uh, good because uh, at, uh, because uh, uh, with 33% overlap area, it also analyzes the whole three, three cross one patch in a one go. So uh, yeah, I got that point. So uh, why don't you think of a pattern such as let's say hexagon uh, with um, zero overlap would not be, uh, would like the semicircular patch would be a better option than let's say an hexagon patch with uh, no overlap, zero percent overlap. So the hex, uh, if hexagon pattern is used, then the extreme rover would have been sent in each of the direction outward from the uh, central rover, and thus it would have created problems in the recollection of the rovers at the site because then site could have been chosen anywhere. And also, if uh, uh, hexagonal pattern was used, then it would have created problem in moving forward. Because the, the next site could have been chosen in the previous, in the lower area of the hexagon, and the uh, next site could have been chosen at the forward of the hexagon, or vice versa, which would have created very, uh, which would have created uh, unpredictable terms in our autonomous system and 
might uh, make it less efficient so a follow up question from this only uh, why did you selected i think the number of sub rover is fixed to 5 right i suppose yes so the actually we use multiple rovers because mm -hmm. our search algorithm works on the basis of parallel search which is based on the idea of subdivision of labor between the extreme rovers mm -hmm. so it had so we divided it among five rovers because multiple permutations of number of extreme rovers were considered but five rovers five extreme rovers was find to be the sweet spot where we where it didn't uh, because if lesser number of extreme rovers were chosen then uh, it would have led to greater distribution of distance among the extreme rovers and thus it uh, the it uh, it would have increased the time of each iteration and uh, to cover the c cross one region our mission time would exceed the 20 hour given time limit also if the extreme rovers exceeds the fifth uh, if the number of extreme rovers exceed the five then the power efficiency of the system went down because charging the uh, number of uh, uh, because charging those many extreme rovers would become inefficient also it would lead, lead to more overlapping of the semicircular region and the overlapping of the uh, uh, semicircular region could uh, increase up to 54% because okay. Uh, yeah okay so now my next question is regarding the communication module i think I think a mesh based module that you have suggested. Can you go back to that slide? Um, yes, sir. Uh, so in this, uh, yeah, in this module, uh, you have uh, five sub rover, I suppose that's what I am calling right now. Uh, have you tested the latency and the bandwidth requirement and other constraint that you will have because? Yes, sir. Your communication is not the traditional from base ascent, uh, station to the rover. So, have you uh, simulated those ideas, those numbers? Do you have those numbers with you to show that yes, this really at the best communication module or system for uh, your space exploration task? Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, first, of all, the major benefit that we get from mesh topology over the traditional wireless network or from the base station is that none of the nodes have to, are limited by the bandwidth of a one single central uh, node. They, they can communicate with the neighboring nodes as well and hence it's a multi-hop system. And this is how they are, uh, we can extend the range to as many, uh, as many uh, links that we want. And at the same time, we can distribute the data in small packets. Hence, they all can communicate parallelly, communicating a large amount of data in a short amount of time. That is one thing. Second, the parameters, we, as we have mentioned in our uh, I, uh, report that we have submitted, the transmitted power of the, I'll distribute all the numeric, all the numbers in uh, tables of antenna specifications and transmission parameters. So for the transmission parameters, the maximum hop that each node can take is two to three. Data size is one gigabyte. The system temperature noise that we have considered for the HF work simulation is 150 to 200 Kelvin. The magnetic waveguide noise because of the soil particulate matter suspended in the uh, atmosphere due to high wind speed is taken to be 0.27 decibel. The minimum reception, reception that we are getting is 5 decibel. Antenna range was uh, selected to be 1 kilometer so that even if one node fails, the, uh, the nodes can still maintain connection and at least the uh, positioning system can work, if not the data transmitted. Because the major part of this communication system was not just to transmit data back to the base station, but also to establish a uh, positioning system for the, inter uh, for the five rovers to uh, properly navigate to the site. Then the channel bandwidth is taken to be 115 kilohertz, whereas the range of frequency is from 4.7 gigahertz to 5.2 gigahertz, because at this particular frequency, the atmospheric um, attenuation due to carbon dioxide and nitrogen molecules, which is the majority in the Martian atmosphere, is coming out to be 10 to the power minus six decibels uh, per meter square. Hence, it, we considered it to be very negligible. And for modeling of the environment, what we exactly did is that the uh, carbon dioxide and nitrogen both do not have electric or magnetic dipoles. Hence, they will cause very less attenuation. Also, the atmospheric particles such as dust and CO2 might cause some attenuation, but the concept is that these particles are so light that they're even suspended in such a thin atmosphere. So the uh, particle size is very less, hence we will get a proper waveguide for a communication system in the uh, atmosphere, in the uh, Martian atmosphere. That is one thing. Now coming to the antenna specifications. The antenna gain is decided to be 9.81 decibels based on the HF work simulation. And it's a circularly polarized antenna as seen by the graph in front of the, uh, in the presentation. It's the minimum 
uh, for the radiation interference because only at the top we are getting the high interference pattern which is neglected and as the uh, graph is uh, very discrepant as we can see we can clearly differentiate the red pattern from the rest of the uh, topography so that is how that particular channels are not selected for the central frequency gain and hence it was selected that 8 decibel will be the center frequency with a beam width of about 120 degrees and the least gain in any direction would be at least 1 decibel which is considered for the antenna range calculation. The radiation efficiency that we have achieved with this simulation and uh, simulation parameters is 92.1 percent. Effective angle okay, is 120 degrees. Sorry, I got your point. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> got your point. Okay, uh, so okay. Uh, other question is uh, I suppose you are also using the LIDAR sensor in all entire subsystem for the navigation module, right? Yes, sir. So have you worked out the, because LIDAR will require a lot of, it's a huge amount of data that has to be transmitted from multiple sub, uh, multiple sub rovers probably and has to be processed. So have you worked out the memory requirement, how it, uh, yes, sir. How it will happen, uh, like the power systems and uh, all those requirements, the constraint that basically the LIDAR system or the data, the LIDAR data will uh, uh, create. Sure, sir. So uh, our single board computer has 16 gigabytes of RAM, which uh, and according to that, we considered that the LIDAR data is calculating around 65 lakh points, which took uh, for 30 minutes, it took around uh, 74 GBs of data. So that uh, data is being stored into the SSD, which is equal to four terabytes. So that along with the scientific data, it can be retrieved after the complete, uh, mission completion. But during the uh, uh, phases of cycle, that when we have to communicate the data from ro extreme rovers to the main rover, it is completely done in a pipeline structure thanks to the extensible core uh, pipeline architecture. So what is exactly happening? As soon as the RAM gets filled, it is being cleared using the virtual source memory concept with the SSD. The LiDAR data is stored to the SSD. SSD sends that data to the pipeline of the node. Node then directly transmits to the other uh, in broadcast, not just communicate. It's a broadcasting network, so it broadcasts the entire data in the mesh network, and hence the uh, starting node, origin node, is able to gain that. And the origin node then sends it back to the base station. So it's a pipeline structure, and we do not require that much amount of storage continuously. It's a continuous processing of data, and hence we are able to. Uh, achieve that in five minutes, which we have uh, calculated uh, based on what the LiDAR data can be. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shoran. That's it from my side, Shoran. Thank you, sir. So yeah, I have a quick question for you guys. I've seen so many things in your science uh, plan. The one is uh, subsurface analysis, surface analysis, atmospheric. So if we reduce the time of uh, 20 hours to suppose uh, maybe two hours so what will be the two experiments or two answers which you will perform like what will be your priority there uh good evening sir i would like to take up the question so sir the system is designed in such a way that even if you reduce the mission time all the systems could work simultaneously providing us all the data required for example the science mission could be completed in 40 minutes for a particular site giving us all okay. the data required for the service subsurface and air. so in 20 hours time how many in and this 20, is you want to perform. Right. In 20 years' time, according to a cycle plan, we have decided to choose 12 such slides. Okay. And uh, how much time did your entire report making and the presentation, this entire project took? So it took us three weeks. Three weeks. And uh, on which subsystem did you spend the most time? So it was a combined effort. So every subsystem was given equal attention. That's a diplomatic answer, but there might be some subsystem where uh, you might have spent more time. Or for example, in the beginning, you have showed us the process, like how did you reach to the results? Like you decided for like five sub rovers, you did not go with the drone. So all that thinking time and brainstorming time, how much time did that take? Then how much time so did I would the... like to... Yeah. So I would like to answer that question. Uh, the report making time and the entire process we started after this uh, development of the cyclic plan was three weeks. But yes, we spent one week to just finalize the cycle plan and uh, performing all the iterations, considering all the shapes of parallel search that we can do on this three cross one region. Finalizing this three cross one region uh, uh, out of the entire layer terrain 
was another big challenge because we wanted to efficiently map the entire region so that we can ex extrapolate the data that we are finding in this region to the entire layer terrain. So the, uh, all this took one week and uh, yes, uh, then we started with the cycle plan and based on that, the other mission uh, and uh, rover capabilities were designed. And did you consider the cost? Like what is the entire cost of this entire thing? So rovers plus rovers, any estimation of uh, that or? The IIDC rulebook mentioned that there were no budget constraints, so we really did not uh, consider cost because it could, uh, you know, they basically okay. uh, suppress our thinking, so creative thinking. So we didn't really worry about the budget. This is the only competition okay. where we can we can explore our creativity to unlimited extent. Uh, I have a question. So uh, I saw like your science section on the report is well researched and the presentation was great. So uh, I'm curious about whether you considered any false positives. Like I saw you have mentioned phosphine in the report, right? So when phosphine was detected on Venus, there were like so many questions about false positive and false negatives. So uh, have you considered anything like that on Mars? And how do you plan to tackle that? Uh, yes, sir. So while researching the various research papers, especially for gas analysis, as you rightly mentioned, phosphine was one of the gases. Along with that, there were several uh, constraints in measuring the band length from spectroscopic analysis for ozone and O2. So those were the gases which also could give us false information. Uh, I'm curious about false positives. Say you detect a particular gas which shows that, which tells you that there is life, but actually it's produced by some geological process. So did you consider? Right. So for, in, order to, in order to tackle that, we have various various redundancy in our system for analysis, gas analysis done by two systems on board the rover. One is the FTI gas analyzer, which is the instrument dedicated for gas. Along with that, we have several gas sensors on board the rover, which is on the extreme rovers, which also analyze the gases. So both the data will be compared on the base station to determine whether any false positives were obtained. Awesome. Yeah, redundancy is the key. Thanks. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so um, I have a conceptual question, actually. Uh, I heard your design precautions about the, uh, for the sake of converse, conversation, let's say um, one of or one or two of your sub rovers experienced some sort of malfunction, malfunction indefinitely, and you couldn't process uh, the data or your main rover couldn't receive it. That doesn't matter. How do you think that this will affect your uh, mission analysis? Like, what will be your approach scientifically? Because it's, it's kind of a risky thing to use five or six sub rovers from that point of view. Uh, yes, I would like to answer that question. So, yes, we are very right that any of the rovers can fail at any point of time. And that is why the parallel search algorithm was chosen. So that at least, if, uh, as you can see from the entire 12 cyclic iterations, the site keeps shifting towards the area where the sites are more probable. That's the nature of this parallel search algorithm. That is one thing. Second, let's say our rovers get malfunctioned. Two, three rovers. We have only two rovers. Still, even if we have one single rover which is going ahead of the main rover and calculating and analyzing the entire terrain so that the main rover which has nuclear reserves for the, for the ASRG is able to traverse smoothly without uh, using much of its active suspension, it is fine for us. So even with one single rover, yes, the efficiency will greatly reduce and we won't be uh, sure enough that in this three cross one region, we have uh, fully mapped it. We can't say that with 100% surety, but still we will be able to cover the entire three cross one region, but yes, to a very less extent. Uh, to a very less extent. And, but uh, again, the thing is that the formation of these layer terrains is very, uh, is ha happening, it has happened over a long period of years. So the changes in this region will be very less. And if we find any conclusive result, and if we can uh, determine the habitability, analyze the habitability through some data points, at least 12 data points, I think it's uh, we can extrapolate that data for this entire region. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you tell me one example 
uh, for each when the rover is going to choose between the two different drive systems. I think one was sure, ATM. Uh, I don't remember the acronyms. Yeah, sure, ATM and ATM. Uh, the uh, risk assessment module is basically uh, using the mechanical parameters of the track drive. So if the track drive is able to uh, traverse over a particular object, which has been defined by the safe threshold, uh, the static threshold value, which is equal to 20 centimeters, uh, the static, uh, the rover will go into the TDM mode. And uh, if it is greater than 20 meter, 20 centimeters, then it will go into the uh, the attack angle, uh, considering the attack angle of the uh, track drive is also less than the uh, the uh, parameter 40 degrees that we have uh, calculated from the mechanical simulation. If that is the thing, then it will again traverse in the track drive mode, but by only by moving its shoulder link, the link which is uh, basically uh, responsible for uplifting the track drive up above the uh, particular object. If it is completely uh, uh, irreversible by the track drive, then the rover will switch into the alternating tetrapod mode by fully using utilizing its active suspension and it will go over the obstacle and that particular height is being mentioned as 40 centimeters that th threshold value okay so the, the, yeah. the, this is uh, is implemented in all the rovers like in the extreme it is implemented in all the rovers but okay. uh, it is only being utilized extensively in the extreme rovers for the main okay. rover, because it also it has the global map, it has all the terrain variations. It is going to choose the uh, path which has least variation in the terrain, so that it can smoothly traverse in a track drive mode. But yes, it does have the uh, alternating tetrapod mode. If anything comes up in the local variation, then uh, it can be it can it is able to uh, traverse that. Great. So if someone else has any question or are we done? So I think that's it. So thanks a lot guys. Thank you, sir. And it was a fantastic presentation and your report was also very good. And you had the answers to all the questions. So yeah, all the very best. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you, you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So the next thing which we have today is a mass over team of uh, IIT Bombay. And uh, I think it is the third IIDC, just like RoverX. And uh, I think they came fourth in 2020. And I don't remember the last year's score. So welcome, guys. And uh, before we move to the presentation, just let me remind you 13 guidelines. You will have 16 minutes to present your design. After that, we'll have a QA session of 15 minutes. And during the presentation, four of you can speak. And during the QA session, all of you can answer a particular question. So, yeah, whenever you're ready, you can please start. Thank you, sir. Gaurav, please present the slides. So, Gaurav, uh, please present. Uh, 
Yeah, guys, you can start now. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, can you please confirm that you can view the slides? Yes, it is visible. All right. Uh, let's just go into presentation mode quickly. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, next slide, please. So, good evening. Uh, we're the IIT Bombay Marshall team from IIT Bombay. We're a multidisciplinary student initiative aimed at ideating Martian based rovers and to build extraterrestrial robotic prototypes. I, along with Lisa and Tejas, are the current team leads of this team. Our team is divided into various subdivisions uh, spanning across years and fields of study. As you can see on the slide, uh, we've got on the electrical and software side, we've got the autonomous hardware and IP subdivision. And on the mechanical side, we've got a suspension robotic arm and wheels and chassis subdivisions. Further, we also have a bioassembly subdivision. Um, this is the uh, rendered CAD of our design this year. Over the course of this presentation, we'll be going into the details of the design and implementation of this program. Uh, handing it over to Tejas for the mechanical design considerations. Hello, uh, I will be explaining the mechanical design of the entire robot. So starting with the wheels. The design of wheel is based predominantly on the region of operation of the rover. Uh, since there is soilized region in the terrain, which is to be explored, boundary region of plenum Australia is considered as standard. And material that we used for wheel envelope is basically aluminum titanium alloy. Uh, we considered that because it had good mechanical properties in the operating temperatures of like negative 150 degrees Celsius. So we basically performed two main simulations to validate our assumptions uh, with the materials and the boundary conditions that we uh, assumed. The top image depicts the simulation results of the drive coupler. This ensures that the radial and axial loads are efficiently transferred through the bearings. The complete wheel assembly is also modeled and simulated to study the longitudinal, lateral, as well as the vertical dynamics of the rover. Further, to provide a fundamental guideline for the grouser interval on the wheel, the linear traveling speed of a wheeled rover with grousers is, moderately, is modeled mathematically. The relationship between the rotation angle and the linear traveling speed is used to derive an angle where the linear speed of a wheeled rover with grousers changes. Coming to the design of grousers and spokes, now the wheel consists of several intricate parts as shown in the figure. Uh, increasing traction was the uh, first priority for the design problem. Uh, this is the reason why we used grousers on the wheel envelope with sides and cuts on it, which increased the traction further. For easy traversal on the hard icy terrain, tungsten carbide studs were engraved on the grouser design. Further, to provide some damping in the vertical direction, Scopes that are used are vertically compliant and laterally stiff. This ensures that the weight of the rover is supported and at the same time some absorption of shocks and twisting forces is done with compliance. We use titanium alloys for making scopes due to its endurance to the impulsive loads. This year we tried to introduce a new mechanism uh, over the previous suspension designs. We use the drive belt mechanism to uh, increase the contact area which helps in increasing traction over layered topography of ice and dust. The design was inspired by the snowmobiles and tanks that aid in the traversal on surfaces having minimal traction. The drive belt, as you can see, comprises of shoes designs to adapt to the uneven terrain and structural intricacies on the surface to develop a better grip. Uh, again, to validate the uh, assumptions, we simulated the shoe of the drive belt. Uh, as you can see, we have performed structural simulation for the uh, shoes of the drive belt. And uh, it ensured that the belt does not undergo linkage break uh, based on the torque uh, of the motor and the radius of the wheel. We found out that there was a negligible deformation compared to the uh, yield strength and uh, ultimate stress. And a uh, good safety factor was observed in the design. 
coming to the chassis now the rover chassis is made up of hollow tubes of square cross section made up of aluminum alloys they are capable of handling torsional as well as bending loads now different structural supports like stepners gussets were also used at locations having high forces and moments because of the on board sub assemblies coming to the suspension we have chosen six wheel rocker bogie sus suspension system manufactured from aluminum and titanium alloys they are capable of surviving in martian polar ice caps after considering several active and passive suspension designs the rocker bogie system was chosen because it provides advantages in terms of stability on the irregular surfaces better obstacle climbing capacity less wheel pressure low stress on links less power requirements and ease of operation the rover materials that have a coating of radiation resistant thermal control paint to prevent from corrosion and electromagnetic radiations further the chosen material have low outgassing and are capable of surviving in cryogenic temperatures as you can see we also performed a few simulations on the suspension uh, it the suspension has mainly a differential bar mechanism that provides dependent motion between two rockers and it uses skid steering mechanism the rocker bogie links are hollow circular tubes capable of withstanding high torsional loads rover dynamics were studied by creating analytical models and final design was evaluated using structural simulations the images on the screen depict static simulations of rocker and bogie links now we come to the robotic arm we are using a 6 degrees of freedom robotic arm for the task during science mission and in general mainly aluminum titanium material was used for the claws we used maxon brushless motors with hall sensors as they can work at temperature below minus 150 degrees celsius a planetary gear box is used for the torque transfer the end effector as you can see consists of a four bar mechanism which is made up of aluminum links and controlled by a bohm and spur gear assembly this end effector can sample soil from ground and pick up small rocks now the links in the robotic arm are again hollow cylinders as they provide strength stability and spread of weight over a wider area the links are controlled by a rotary actuator which offer better stability while lifting loads and performing various operations and also enable more precise control we are using a claw under assembly as the end effector which can collect soil from up to 10 cm of depth the base provides a 330 degrees of rotation which covers a good enough range for sample transfer now i hand over to mayank for the science expedition hello i am mayank and uh, i'll guide you through the science expedition so the main aim of science expedition is to uh, perform analysis of minerals and biology around the uh, rover in terms of soil and air analysis the first uh, uh, system in our uh, science expedition is a sampling system using which we collect samples on which we will perform our experiments we collect samples from soil and air particulate soil samples are collected using a 6 degrees of freedom robotic arm equipped with a two finger claw and a drill bit to extract soil from various kinds of terrain the task of the arm is to transfer soil samples from the ground to the experiment assembly which is on board the rover apart from that we also collect samples from air in terms of suspended particulate matter using electrostatic precipitator and this sample is also used to perform the same xtt and uh, safranin test uh, as the soil sample next we head up to our experiment assembly we have uh, two main equipments which we use for experiments which are the microscope and the spectrometer the uh, microscope is used to perform xtt and safranin test and uh, use uh, for the microscope we also have linear actuator to drop the sample onto the slide and also a 6 degree of freedom steward platform to help uh, focusing of sample and also mixing the sample with the reagent we also use spectrometer to perform non contact raman spectroscopy using a high intensity laser light of wavelength 532 nanometers the interaction of laser with ro rock or soil whichever sample it is analyzing produces a diffraction pattern and this diffraction pattern corresponds to the chemical composition of our analysis we also perform additional tests uh, for uh, supporting our data uh, one of them is the cell viability test viability is basically of a measure of uh, whether a cell can sustain itself in terms of metabolic activities we detect cell viability using xtt dye assays test we also collect atmospheric data using multiple sensors like ph co2 wind sensor etc and uh, for additional insights into the soil and subsurface data we have a subsurface analysis probe which consists of temperature and ph sensor 
using which uh, we ensured that we collect uh, these data from the subsurface without having it contaminated with the topsoil and uh, support our insights into the soil biological analysis. Next, we head into the electrical and software subsystem. Hi, thanks, man. Uh, so um, the electrical and software subsystem covers the onboard electronics as well as the autonomous and manual software that runs on the rover. Uh, can we go? Yes. So for the onboard electronics, uh, it's all controlled by a powerful Intel NUC, uh, 10 i7 5 nh The rover uses Roboclaw motor controllers to provide closed loop drive and arm control. Apart from that, the rover also uses a Z2 stereo camera and a LiDAR for autonomous navigation. Further, it uses a host of cameras and sensors to interact with the environment and perform image processing and bioscience detection. On the left of uh, the table, you can see the overall power requirements for the rover. Next slide, please. Um, so as the main onboard power source, we've opted for the advanced Stirling radio, radio isotope generator. It consumes a significantly less radioactive fuel compared to an MMRT device and is a highly dependable power supply. It has the added benefit of radiating high levels of heat, making it an ideal method to keep the electrics warm and within their operating temperature. The ASRG in tandem with a pair of eight cell batteries meets the power requirements of the rover under various operating conditions. Next slide, please. For communications, we've opted for a two-prong approach with the main heavy bandwidth transmission taking place over a ruckus wireless bridge. Um, this communicates to the base station directly and uh, provides live stream data as well as manual control options. If under adverse circumstances, should the rover fail to communicate the base station, it is equipped with a high gain antenna on the UFH band as well as X band antennas to communicate with the deep space network. Hello, my name is Kulshin and I'll tell you about the autonomous and image processing subsystem. The autonomous navigation consists of various levels. To move autonomously, the rover needs to first perceive the environment and based on that, a least cost path is prepared and then a local planner kicks in to follow that path. Stereo camera, LiDAR, and a ground penetrating radar are primarily used for constructing the 3D map of the environment. A basic path planning algorithm consists of a A-star global planner that works on an artificial potential field and minimizes the cost over that field. The field is calculated primarily based on the 3D map created. This is then improved upon by incorporating a dynamic slip prediction algorithm in the potential field. We first classify the terrain type and then using that along with slope, get an estimate over the slip. This is then followed by a modified future trajectory estimation that takes slipping into account and other uncertainties. Then we improve upon by fusing visual odometry with other sensor data. We also reduce accumulated errors by regularly doing a bundle adjustment. Lastly, we employ recovery methods that tries to recover possible issues like failure in localization by itself, but also includes calling for remote manual help in case of critical failures. Next up, I would like to present the rover design related to IP and vision. We propose to use three on-rover cameras. First is the stereo navigation camera, which is mounted high on the mast. It would fetch the depth map of the environment and aid in manual and autonomous navigation. Next up is hazard cam mounted below the chassis. It would capture up to three meters of the terrain and would help in avoiding rocks and craters. Lastly, we propose to use a camera on the robotic arm, which would be used for picking up soil or rock samples by the robotic arm. If the layout of the terrain is known beforehand, the size can be explored uh, and the plan can be made better. So for effective pre-emission analysis, we require high resolution images of the terrain. Based on the assumption that we have obtained the orthographic image prior, we propose image super resolution algorithm based on super resolution restoration model. The algorithm is essentially based on a Bayesian approach for evaluating high resolution images. Next, we propose an automated scene change detection algorithm for detecting changes in the environment. This detection is then used for capturing high resolution images and are later separately analyzed. This is based on SIFT feature detection. If the number of features detected are less than a certain threshold, then a change is detected. 
Now, for enhancing the slip prediction algorithm, a terrain type is taken as the input. Here we propose an automated terrain classification algorithm. The features are extracted from the inference image using pixel intensities around the target pixel. Then the nearest neighbor classifier predicts the terrain type based on an existing database. Lastly, we propose a lossless compression algorithm essential for video streaming. The compression algorithm is based on two subroutines. One is adaptive differential pulse code modulation, which transmits the difference in consecutive signal rather than the actual signal, and reducing the size, especially for near constant signals like videos. The adaptive stream based entropy coding can be used for further compression. This encoding is based on lookup tables containing mapping from encoding to actual data maintained dynamically by receiver and transmitter. Thank you. We'll now be taking questions. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you go to the slide of your drive system? Uh, sorry, sir, could you please repeat which slide? The drive system, the wheel and the chain drive that you have. I think it was in the beginning. The drive system. Yeah. Well, mechanical oh, drive. Yeah, mechanical drive system. Yeah. Uh, what is the material of the chain that you have used? So we have used uh, uh, Kevlar pads and uh, uh, some uh, material composites, uh, which which can be uh, used for, which are uh, normally used in uh, the drive pads for tanks and snowmobiles. Okay, okay. I have one very simple question. I do not see any. Okay, what if the belt comes off? Because I do not see any kind of uh, protection system to make sure that the belt will stay on those two wheels. Because when it is moving on the terrain, suppose uh, one of the belt or one of the elements of the belt gets damaged. So what if in that case, the belt comes off from one of the sides? Do you have uh, any kind so, of, have you thought about that? So we we have, uh, they have actually not made it redundant. Rather, the wheel itself have a lot of uh, other mechanisms to enable traction and uh, uh, traverse all over the terrain. Therefore, even if the belt comes out, uh, the wheel uh, can uh, tra traverse normally on the terrain. But there is no as such uh, redundancy in the drive belt. Uh, yeah, guys, uh, Neil, you're done with the question? Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, I saw that you have like a huge mast for the uh, battery systems and all of that. Like your power unit is basically in the back, right? And it's at a more elevated uh, area than uh, the rest of the rover. So have you done any kind of uh, analysis as to where your exact center of mass of this rover lies? Because you're going over inclines or on craters um, or like, yeah. So how are you? Uh, where is the exact center of mass uh, of the rover? And um, the next question was, where is the exact drive system? Like, because uh, even the motors uh, or I don't see like any in the design directly, I don't see any uh, wheel drive systems. Uh, I just see the tubes, right? So if you could just like probably uh, show me that a little bit more in detail. Yeah, so have you done, first, first question, have you done any center, uh, analysis on where the center of mass lies? And second question is, yeah, uh, what is, where, where is your drive system exactly? Yeah, so the center of the center of mass is like little bit behind uh, on the chassis itself because due due to the uh, weight of the power uh, equipment and the drive as you can see with the cursor, cover up is highlighting the wheel. So just behind the wheel and uh, between the suspensions and of the rocker bogey, there are uh, maximum motors attached. Uh, so so what is the uh, diameter of those motors and what kind of motors are those? Uh, they are brushless DC motors, and uh, the diameter of the shaft is 10 mm. No, the whole so the whole dimension okay. of the motor is uh, so for such a big rover, you're telling me like the whole diameter of the shaft is only 10 mm. What's the, what's the total weight of the rover? 
total weight of the rover uh, we uh, haven't exactly calculated but uh, it is approximately the if, if you don't if you haven't calculated the weight of the rover how did you guys decide what would be the specifications of the drive motor right so we haven't used the exact weight uh, parameter since the all the parts that we have made are a uh, bit custom so we have assumed the weight to be around 50 to 60 kg and based on that we have done the calculation how much how much 50 to 60 kg okay 50 to 60 kg got it okay okay i have a question here yeah. are you done okay uh so uh, my question is uh, for the science domain if you can please go to that slide it would be helpful yeah uh, the next one so uh, i see that you are using microscope to and the staining approach based on a report so uh, when we do some simple staining like say gram staining and i see some of the stains you have mentioned are from that so uh, when we do that we take a culture uh, like a drop from a culture and that culture has about like that particular drop itself is having thousands or even more uh, microbial cells but do you expect similar amount of cells on mars also uh, you will be having a lot of soil uh, regolith with in in the sample right so how do you plan to distinguish between microbes and regolith and do you have any purification mechanism uh so uh, coming to your first question uh, we do not expect to find like uh, that uh, huge concentration of uh, uh, means microscopic life like uh, for earth analysis we use cultures which are uh, relatively more concentrated in terms of cells which we are looking for so yes we are uh, looking for a relatively lower number of cells and uh, apart from the and uh, as far as uh, distinguishing between regolith and uh, normal cells is concerned i think uh, one factor which we are using is the uh viability test the xtt viability test which uh, uh, dwells on the relative uh, parameter of darkness of the uh, coloration so i think uh, we are looking for a minimal coloration to even ensure that there is some form of microscopic life at all and uh, yes uh, you are absolutely right that uh, our collected sample will have a very low proportion of actual microscopic life and a lot more uh, uh, materials in terms of regolith and uh, that thing okay uh, the next question is uh, uh, are you using some form of gas analysis because in the report as i read i see that you are measuring the amount of co2 but are there any uh, gas analysis which will help you with life detection or biosignature detection uh, we are not exactly uh, performing gas analysis as such uh, we are uh, uh, in terms of uh, extracting uh, any form of insight from the atmosphere we are uh, precisely using aerobiology in terms of particulate matter analysis but uh, we are not explicitly going into any particular gas analysis okay thank you yeah. i have uh, one question regarding the navigation task what is the uh, motivation behind using the ground penetrating radar so the main motivation behind using the ground penetrating radar is geysers to avoid uh, the, just the surface before geysers or in case accidental eruption of geysers okay uh, second thing is you have mentioned somewhere about the change detection uh, what exactly it would be useful for in the navigation mm. right so it won't be useful for navigation rather it is used for um, post mission analysis of certain changes in the environment which are missed uh, manually so this change detection algorithm would uh, uh, detect sudden changes in environment and capture images on such events so uh, in this case your rover is uh, it's not stationary it's moving and uh, moving around the terrain uh, in the entire area Right. so how do you plan to uh, capture the change when the rover itself is moving how do how you analyze that how you take that into uh, your analysis right. so the algorithm uh, depends on something called sift feature detectors so it measures uh, the matching features between consecutive images and if those matches are below certain threshold the number of such matches are below certain threshold then the change is detected so even if the rover is moving and 
certain matches uh, are result in number above threshold, then the change won't be detected. And uh, you think that you will have enough matches using the SIFT feature detector to perform this change detection task? Uh, you see based, on the, based on the uh, research paper which we which uh, we use for as a motivation for this algorithm, um, yes, like uh, these are quite successful uh, algorithms for detecting changes. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Is there someone who wants to ask a question or shall we conclude? Okay, I think we are done. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. And uh, it's good to have you. Thank you for your time. And uh, we liked your presentation a lot. Compared to the report, it was better, I think. So, yeah, good luck. Thank you for your time and having us in the friends. Yeah, so the next team which we have is team legendary from Poland. So yeah, they will be joining in a minute, I guess. Yeah, hello guys. And uh, before we move to the presentation, let me remind you with the guidelines. You will have 16 minutes to present your design. After we will have Q and A for the next 15 minutes. During the presentation time, only four of you can speak. And during the Q and A, all 10 can take part in it. So yeah, whenever you're ready, please start. Okay, so I think we are ready. Uh, Michal, are you ready? Okay, uh, maybe from the beginning. Okay, hello, welcome at our presentation about Martin Rover, designed by legendary Rover team working in Rzeszów University of Technology. At first, we would like you to thank you for the possibility of taking part in this competition and for giving us a chance to participate at International Rover Design Challenge Finals. We are a legendary rover team working in Rzeszów, Poland, at Rzeszów University of Technology. Our team gathers members from five different university faculties. Most of our team members are from mechanical engineering and aeronautics faculty, but nonetheless, each team member, despite the faculty, is crucial in designing the process of the rover. In 2022 International Rover Design Challenge, 24 ro legendary, legendary rover team members took part in competition and designing process. To work in the most efficient manner, we came up with an idea how to divide people to groups that will work on specific parts, but also cooperate with other groups to create fully working and reliable rover. In the graphics on this slide, we are able to see the division. Responsible for the work of all members of legendary rover team is CEO with uh, three board members with him. Other members were divided to teams which were responsible for mechanical design, electronical design, software and hardware design, science plan design, marketing and finances. Each team had their team leader whose tasks was to allocate members to tasks as for example, designing suspension, software, samples collection system. What's more, marketing and finances team not included in system concept review was crucial during this competition because of finding resources and money to take part in the International Rubber Design Challenge and allow designing process to move on. 
Inside of this slide, we are able to see render of our rover. Now I would like to tell about presentation agenda. After team introduction and telling about team preparations to 2022 International Rover Design Challenge, we would like, you, we would like to move forward to explanation of rover subsystems such as mechanical design, science plan design, electronical systems of the rover, and power system of the rover. At the end of the presentation, we would like you to show you once again our short video of rover taking a soil sample. Now, I am going to talk about mechanical design of our rover. The main topics I will present will be body, which consists of the frame and sheathing, suspension, which, is, which, which consists of uh, swings, swing arms and shock absorbers, and wheels. Uh, the dimension, dimensions of our rover is uh, 121 centimeters in length, 120 centimeters in height, and 126 centimeters in width. Uh, the weight of our rover is below 90 kilos. The frame is made out of 6060 aircraft grade duralumin square profile. Apart from being the mounting point for suspension assembly, communication masts and rover's robotics, uh, robotic arm, its secondary purpose is to house the vital electronic components, MMRTG power supply on, and onboard science lab. Our design is based on uh, load analysis using uh, uh, finite elements method. Whole frame is covered in sheathing, which, which serves a mainly protective function for housed equipment. It is necessary to shield such components from dust, low temperatures, increased level and increased level of radiation. On other hand, we wanted to save as much mass as possible, so we made it out of the laminate composite material. Uh, Next, uh, our suspension assembly is based on multiple swing arm, swing arm design. To ensure structural integrity, uh, we conducted multiple stress simulations do, using FAM. The material uh, used is Duralumin Alloy 7075. This material is known for its torsional and bending strength. There are six pairs of swing arm present and a, pa a pair for each wheel. For the shock absorbers, we used our own magnetic designs. Uh, due to low temperature present on, present on the surface of the Mars, we had to consider decreasing. Uh, we had to consider decreasing magnetic flux with temperature. Shock absorbers are equipped with heaters to sub stabilize magnet operating, uh, operating temperatures. In addition, we are capable of changing the temperature of the magnets to control the suspension characteristics. Next. For the wheels, we have chosen the full metal airless design. The main idea behind such solution is to relieve stress uh, put on suspension. Traction is provided by series of flanges and spikes. In this case, stress simulations were also made. Uh, so we can see this on this presentation. Now I would like to talk about our robotic arm and its equipment. Uh, so our manipulator has five degrees of freedom and its design consists of two arms which shape of coupled flat bars connected with joints gives us resistance to bending forces and provides stiffness and resistance to torsion. All of my manipulator parts are made of 7075 aluminum alloy would give us a best weight to material strength, strength ratio. To obtain movement precision of mechanical arm our team decided to use electric geared motor coupled to planetary bevel gearbox to rotary stage of the arm, brush and electronic motors for manipulators arm and sample collection equipment movement. At last, two stage cycloidal gearbox driven by electric gear motor from a brush motor. It deserves a special attention because it was designed by one of our team members. Uh, in this slide, uh, we are able to see uh, uh, pictures of cycloidal gear and manipulator arm. Uh, science module in our rover consists of two parts, uh, science collection equipment and rotary sample storage system. The first one is responsibility for sample collection by using manipulator place uh, sample in laboratory module, in which the sample is analyzed for life and its basic parameters. 
When sample collection equipment uh, is parallel to Mars surface, extended the entire mechanism so that it's able to take a sample. Thanks to a planetary gearbox, drill and housing are moving in opposite directions, which makes it very easy to take a sample. After the sample is taken, it stands in temporary storage uh, section where it's wait until the manipulator rotates 180 degrees and the SCE is directly over the pipe lending to rotary sample storage system. Once the sample is in the rotary sample storage system, is it analyzed uh, in turn by a spectrometer, which performs an analysis of the elements composition of the substance based uh, the record spectrum. We used a mass spectrometer that allows us to analyze the statistical uh, distribution of the mass of atoms in the sample, making it possible to identify uh, most chemical uh, molecules using the detected elements. We access the uh, probability of the extension of life on Mars. The sample is um, then examined by pH meter along with a thermometer, and finally the sample is photographed by examined with microscope in terms of geological structures, in terms of uh, appearances of life. Let me present our electronic system. Uh, it consists of three main parts. Electronic control unit, which is simply called ECU, motherboard and operating station. And this, on, on this slide, you can see our ECU. It consists of uh, 11 subsections, uh, diagnostic legs for maintenance stuff, GPS and IMU connector for obtaining position and orientation of the vehicle, power sockets to distribute the power to external devices, output sockets to drive external devices such as motors, logic supply power to supply our mi microcontroller, STM32L series microcontroller, which gives us many hardware resources to create a sufficient operating system. USB connector, which enables the ECU to connect it to the motherboard over USB cable. Bypass jumpers to, to choose whether external should be driven directly from microcontroller or through insulated pads and enables us, us to perform hardware reset in case of sensor failure. MOSFET control section, which drives MOSFET with operational amplifiers. The next part of our system is motherboard, which is equipped with neural network and software controlling information flow between vehicle and operating station. This neural network is also processing images obtained from cameras, so we get a pro protection, uh, an additional protection uh, from obstacles. Our, our navigation system is based on GPS receiver, IMU sensor, LiDAR, and neural network predictions. Operating station is provided with data and video from vehicle wirelessly. Our communication system is based on five gigahertz transmitters and receivers and 344 megahertz transceivers. The communication is encrypted, so only person responsible for the mission is able to manipulate the vehicle over the radio. In our project, we have to use drone as a repeater of the signal, so the maximum distance between operating station and the vehicle is extended. Operating station is an ordinary PC or laptop. Any computer is supporting Linux. It enables astronaut to perform unnecessary interactions with vehicle to perform any mission and check main states of the system. Our system's ar architecture enables us to create additional software components on operating station site, which will manipulate communicates to perform any mission desired. Now I'd like to tell about the power system of our rover. Basing on reliable sources like NASA, we decided to power up our rover with multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, what in abbreviation is MMRTG. To the best of our knowledge, it is the most reliable, efficient and safe power system, which can work even for 13 years of mission with 5 kilograms of plutonium dioxide. In addition, it, its weight and sizes are perfect to use in our rover. This generator relies on plutonium radioactive decay, which produces a lot of heat. With that heat and difference of temperatures on thermocouple, Seebeck effect occurs, what generates electricity. This generator is able to produce constantly 110 watts of power. For any higher piece of energy demand, additional power source is provided by 
MER Li Ion batteries. They are charged from MMRTG and each battery is controlled independently by battery control board to be charged and, and uncharged in its allowable limits to prevent unsafe situation of overcharging or over discharging. Thanks to its good performance in various temperatures from very low to high, excellent life cycle characteristics, it was obvious choice for us to use them in our rover. And at the end of the presentation, as I mentioned previously, we would like you to show you once again our video, uh, how our rover takes sample of soil. And thank you for your attention. Now we would be more than happy to answer any questions related to our project. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so, uh, hello, uh, nice presentation. Uh, my first question is uh, that you use GPS on your rover and we don't have GPS on the Mars. So uh, can you describe your approach during implementing that in the project? Yes, before the start of the mission, we have sent uh, G GPS satellites, uh, which are uh, cursing uh, around the Mars, so we can use GPS receivers. Uh, okay, so, um, okay, so my uh, another question will be about uh, a pneumometer uh, for wind measure. Uh, you used like a typical anemometer that we are using on the air. And can you justify your choice? Like, uh, can you describe what is the accuracy of the anemometer and its uh, capabilities to measure the wind on Mars? So basically, when we're speaking about the wind, uh, it's hard to measure wind on our rover, which is approximately one and a half meter of heights. Uh, when you want to measure wind, uh, to be exact, you should measure it at if it's typical 10 meters to avoid any fraction caused by the ground. So our aim was to just measure this near ground uh, wind speed just to get the necessary data. Unfortunately, we can't avoid uh, this fraction um, error caused by this small distance between Earth and our rover. Uh, okay, and uh, don't you think that the density of this wind will be uh, will not be sufficient uh, to move uh, this uh, anemometer? Because, uh, like, you know, uh, it's quite low. So um, the mechanical mechanism, uh, there's a possibility that this mechanical mechanism will not turn. Yes, that's a good uh, sentence. However. We need to remember that we have also dust in the air and dust storm, and mainly our wind uh, speed indicator was meant to measure the wind speed during any dust storms when we had bigger particles which will help to move. However, still we need to uh, remember about this error. Okay, and uh, another question. Uh, like your wheels uh, have empty spaces inside. Uh, you didn't use solid wheel, uh, like like the frame of the wheel, uh, like the, the wheel rim. Uh, so uh, can you justify your choice? And can you tell us what will happen if the rover will traverse uh, in the dry ice or uh, some soft regolith? Like, and what is the, your approach in implementing that like don't you think it will stuck uh because the regolith will fall inside the wheel uh, okay so about the wheel so uh, we ensured the grip and the uh, mobility of the wheel by implementing spikes implementing flanges across the uh, the whole diameter of the wheel so uh, it is uh, very little uh, very little surface uh, to surface connection um, to uh, 
better act on the ice, on the frozen ground, because our mission will be, uh, operate near uh, near the pole. So uh, we predicted that there will be lower temperatures there. So it is basically the spikes and the flanges are are providing enough traction air and are not uh, uh, sticking to the surface. Uh, flat uh, i think the the surface area to, uh, that sticks to the surface is not uh, uniform it's uh, it's in points yeah so it it will probably don't stick uh okay and uh my last question uh like uh what about uh, imu and can you describe it more uh, and also, you said that um, you will use LIDAR. Uh, and what will happen if you will have uh, the flat surface uh, and uh, there will be problem with, with LIDAR? And also, what about corrections? Uh, I can hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, what kind of problems with uh, LIDAR do you mean? Uh, there's, uh, if it comes to navigation, uh, I think that can be a problem because uh, like you can only measure the flat surface and there's the problem, like, uh, like you don't have the point uh, what to avoid. Uh, yes, uh, as I have said, uh, we are also using the vision in our navigation system uh, as a support for obstacle de detection. But um, about the LiDAR, uh, the LiDAR gives us uh, uh, the distance from uh, our vehicle to any obstacle in the area uh, in some angle. And there is a camera uh, which is uh, trained to detect uh, thousands of uh, uh, objects. So it is kind of an enhanced uh, system of uh, detecting the obstacles. And uh, the IMU, it is uh, used uh, to get the orientation, I mean, uh, like the angle uh, from the destination point to uh, relatively to the actual point and uh, just the orientation of the vehicle. And uh, it uh, helps us to get uh, uh, the difference between uh, the height of the ground on which the vehicle is standing and the ground on the next uh, sub point on, of our destination point. So. Uh, any hill, uh, that's not a problem because uh, our neural network is trained on many like uh, uh, data uh, records, uh, which we have uh, gathered before. And uh, uh, it simply can detect that there is a hill ahead uh, and there is no obstacle. Okay, thank you. So uh, that was my last question. I have a question about your science failure. So uh, I see that you're trying to measure pH, right? So uh, can you just describe the mechanism? How do you plan to measure the pH? I see that there is a revolver, but yeah, can you describe it more? Uh, and then I'll ask my next question. Mm, okay. Uh, the pH meter uh, have... Uh, mm, uh, DC motor, uh, uh, which who uh, he going down to the uh, to the sample of of the of the soil. Uh, so and uh, the revolver uh, at the next. Uh, if you want to uh, next try, uh, he mm, go around. So uh, it's. Uh, I don't know. I uh, it's uh, good uh, what I said. Yeah. So uh, my question is about for uh, measuring pH, you will need water, right? Or do you have 
something which does not. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's important. We, should, we need water when we want to measure pH, but we thought more about warming the um, probe just to get the ions, uh, which we can detect in our pH meter. Mm, okay. That's an important issue we were dis dis uh, discussing about it really before our report. Okay, cool. And uh, so what kind of pH range do you expect and what do you infer from that? Say if you detect uh, an environment which is highly acidic, what's your next step? Like what information? How is that helpful to you? So basically, we want to. Um, our rover is prepared just to just. Uh, our rover is uh, his task is to just get new uh, probes, which we can later measure in our lab on our base. So basically, if we see that the pH meter is anormal then we can get uh, more samples later to be detected in our um, in our base. And of course, we have also other um, useful um, detectors like a microscope, which can take photos before, of course, hitting the probe. And that is why we can get also the exact photos what, what we are um, measuring. Awesome, thank you. I have a question. Um, okay, so uh, due to the possible instant temperature temperature changes, the strength of materials may be affected. Uh, you mentioned that you made uh, certain choices for your suspension designs, like on magnets, etc. Uh, can you give me more details about how your uh, wheel design may be affected? Maybe it may affect the stress on your suspensions with the combined effect with the possible temperature problems. Okay, uh, it will not because uh, our suspension is equipped with the heaters, as I said in presentations, uh, which is the just a resistive wire which is wind up uh, around the magnets. So we can control the temperature of the magnets uh, in any point of time. Uh, and about the wheels, the wheels, we we looked up the data, uh, data sheets, uh, data, uh, data for the materials behavior in cryogenic temperatures and spring steel behaves quite well in, in, in this kind of, this sort, sort of temperature. So uh, we can mutilate this, uh, this effect by just increasing temperature, decreasing temperatures on the uh, shock absorbers itself. Okay, so uh, conceptually, uh, what do you think that's going to happen if the temperature gets uh, very low, then your um, heaters could uh, ever like affect more than you anticipated? Okay, so the uh, we also included the uh, the graph of the changing of magne magnetic flux uh, with the temperature. Uh, the temperatures on Mars does not exceed 150 uh, degrees Celsius mm -hmm. below zero. So uh, we think that it will never go to uh, the point where it is significant because the uh, fluctuations of the change in magnetic flux uh, oscillate between 5% uh, within within range, which we can uh, accommodate for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, I see you have used lithium-ion batteries. So do you have any kind of protection mechanism in case the battery fails or catches fire? Okay, uh, so I will answer the question. Uh, as I said, in our uh, in our power system, uh, each battery has its uh, battery control board, and it is uh, um, every battery is looked after independently to prevent the situation because uh, catching up a fire in in the space uh, would be uh, disastrous. We can say so. Um, this is a uh, a special control board to each battery 
which uh, prevents overcharging, which could lead to the explosion of the battery. And uh, in addition, uh, the battery blocks are um, covered or hidden in spe special boxes, which in case of um, explosion will prevent uh, the explosion, explosion force to uh, harm other parts of the rover. Okay, so other than the control circuitry, you, you do not have any other kind of mechanism other than the battery casing to pre prevent uh, any kind of battery fire hazards. Uh, we didn't use in our over uh, fire extinguishing uh, materials. Uh, yeah, we, we because um, we look after and uh, this uh, battery control board was designed by JPL and it was used successfully in many, many NASA missions and uh, it, it didn't happen uh, in the history of this technology to to explode uh, uh, in this space. So uh, we think that technology is as reliable that we can uh, uh, successfully use it in our rover without concerning about the, the explosion. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let me please uh, give to a word uh, because our electronic system is also fused. Uh, so electronics uh, won't drain the batteries. So it's also a, a kind of a fuse, uh, fuse which uh, fuses, which prevents from exploding. Okay. Yeah, great. So Pranav, do you have any question? Or no, I'm good, for now, sir. I'm good for now. Okay, so I think that's it, guys. So yeah, your presentation was good and report was also good. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a good day. Goodbye. So next thing which we have is team DJ Santrix and they're participating for the first time. So uh, hello everyone, I'm audible to you all. Yes. Uh... Hello, sir. Yeah, so before we move to the presentation, let me take you through the guidelines. So you will have 16 minutes to present your design, and after that, we will have QA session for the next 15 minutes. During the QA session, all 10 of you can take part, and during the presentation, only four of you can speak. So whenever you are ready, please share your presentation and you can start. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, we are team DJ Santarich, and uh, we 10 of us will be participating in this uh, presentation round. So may I please share my uh, screen? Yeah, you can proceed. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, can I com confirm if my uh, screen is visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Sir. Yes, sir. So. Uh, we'll start the presentation. Good evening, everyone. We DJS Antariksh, the official Martian rover team of Dwarkadas J. Sangvi College of Engineering, are a team of 40 space enthusiasts working together in five sub departments with a single goal of creating a prototype Martian rover. The sub departments are coding, electronics, marketing, mechanical, and science. DJS Antariksh is based in Mumbai, India, founded in the year 2019. To decipher unimaginable is the motto with which we have designed our rover, Abhigyan, which translates to wisdom. Ruben will now present the mechanical design for the same. Abhigyan weighs 1,000 kilograms and is 3.1 meters in length and 2.5 meters in width and 2.7 meters in height. The mechanical structure of the rover consists of three main subsystems, the drive system, the chassis, and the robotic arm. 
the dry system is further divided into three sub-assemblies, suspension, differential, and wheels. The dry system is solely responsible for the mobility of the rover while keeping the chassis stable throughout the traversal over the Martian terrain. The suspension utilizes a six-wheel parallel bogey craft suspension system, which provides unrivaled obstacle traversal capabilities in comparison to standard suspension systems. Owing to its simple geometry, it provides a very sturdy structure on which the chassis has been mounted. The suspension linkages are made hollow and fully enclosed, which provide an airtight seal at the joints, preventing dust from entering it. The motors present in the linkages above the four corner wheels allow for steering and on-spot rotation of the rover. The suspension is accompanied by the differential part, which has been mounted on the front face of the chassis to provide the desired mirror opposite motion on both sides of the suspension. Our rover is equipped with titanium mesh wheels, which can deform up to the brace when it comes in contact with large and sharp rocks. Titanium sheet metal threads provide good traction on both icy and rock, rocky terrain. The chassis provides a framework which houses the electronic components, science lab, ASRG, etc. It is predominantly divided into three parts, the outer covering, the chassis skeleton, and the inner covering. The outer covering is made out of multiple layers of titanium alloy, which transmits surface load to the skeleton made up of custom weldments. The inner consists of multiple layers, predominantly nanosilica aerogel, which gives heat insulation, and polyelastomeric foam, which provides protection against radiation. Avigyan's robotic arm has five degrees of freedom, which provides sufficient workspace to carry out various operations efficiently. The tubular linkages are made of titanium alloy, which provide torsional rigidity. The robotic arm is driven by using a set of harmonic drives and a bevel gear mechanism. The harmonic drive ensures high accuracy and power transmission with zero backlash. The bevel gear box was used to make the arm more compact and efficient. Depending upon the ro rotation of the bevel gear, the gear box can provide both rotary and twisting motion. The turret consists of the gripper, hybrid drill, extra diffractor and cameras. The three-finger gripper works on a leads to base mechanism which provides good gripping force to help pick up small rock samples. Hybrid drill bit combines the polycrystalline diamond compact fixed cutting and roller-free cutting structures for smooth drilling, great torque control and accurate maneuverability. Now Vedangi will give an overview of the electronic subsystems. Okay, so the power unit of our rover houses ASRG, batteries, and battery management systems. The power distribution will supply power to all the subsystems. The telemetry system handles the entire communication of the rover, which includes omnidirectional, directive, and UHF antenna. In the event of our PDB fails, we have a backup system in place. The onboard science subsystem will enable our rover to carry out different experiments useful for the mission and conclude results efficiently. Our telemetry system consists of ultra high frequency antenna for communication with satellites which operate at the frequency of 400 megahertz, an omnidirectional antenna for receiving commands and a directive antenna to transmit the acquired data in the frequency range of 800 to 900 megahertz. The rover is programmed to transmit data from the data acquisition system at regular intervals throughout the soul, which is transmitted to the base station using a directive antenna. Essential information will be sent to the satellite in case of communication failure. The omnidirectional antenna is modified to detect potential communication attempts from unknown rovers. This information is relayed to the computer, which instructs the Yagi antenna to disconnect from the base station, directing itself to establish communication with the unidentified rover. Such a mechanism makes our system efficient for futuristic missions. Mm -hmm. Components work inefficiently when used in extremely low temperatures. Radioisotope heaters, heating units, are placed at required positions, which form uh, the heating system. We have also designed a heating mechanism based on the flow of CFCs to provide consistent warmth throughout the rover. In case of overheating, the heat rejection system will be activated on the indication of heat flow sensors and thermostats, resulting in the circulation of CFCs stored in the radiator tank unit, bringing the entire subsystem to an optimum temperature. ASRG uses the Stirling power conversion technology, which converts the radioactive decay heat of plutonium into electricity and is four times more efficient than radioisotope power systems. It is lighter in weight than MMRTG and is utilized to generate electricity with a 26% efficiency. 
A BMS safeguards its battery by preventing it from exceeding its safe operating limits and by keeping a check on overcurrent, under voltage, and overheating. BMF's prime objective is to monitor voltage and temperature and alert the system when any of the parameters crosses the calibrated threshold value. The backup system consists of a PDV that, the powers, that powers the CPU, the directive antenna, and the heating system. In case of any failure of the battery or the main PDV, the backup system ensures that the communication with the rover and the base station doesn't break. It sends a distress signal to the base station while transferring important mission analysis data to the base station. During dust storms, the rover antennas are not able to communicate with the base station as well as satellite. Hence, XCOM is implemented. The high penetration of X-rays enables XCOM to achieve lower signal attenuation than conventional optical communication. Next is mast cam assembly is set of four cameras that consist of two mast cams to analyze artificial objects and two nav cams to acquire images for support of auto navigation, robotic arm operations and mobility planning. The two degrees of freedom with a case of protecting it from dust storms, various gases and atmosphere, etc. There are six hash cams, four on the bottom corners and two on top of surface facing sideways on the chassis. There is a depth sensing camera for analysis of the surface that the rover is approaching. The arm has two hash cams, one on drill, another on gripper, and a multi-sense S7 for soil analysis and close-up photos. All the camera lenses have a thin, clear protective coating to prevent harmful radiations. With this, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Tahir. We will be using satellite imagery to create an image data set for the terrain, which will be used to perform object detection to look for sites bearing scientific importance. To address this, satellite imagery, multi-scale rapid detection, and window networks are best suited as it has an accuracy of 97% and includes a modified version of YOLO. We will initialize the origin of the map constructed using the satellite image based on the starting point of the rover at the start of the mass mission, and it will provide us with the coordinates which will be computed and sent to the rover as checkpoints for path traversal. LiDAR is typically faster and more accurate. However, Visual Slam sees more of the scene as it has more dimensions. Visual Slam is sensitive to texture and light and requires huge amounts of data and has a very short range. On the other hand, occupancy-based LiDAR is dedicated to 2D environments and has a difficult loop closing process, while graph-based LiDARs need to estimate very accurately the edges and statistical links between the nodes. We use Visual LiDAR Fusion-based Slam to overcome these shortcomings. To perform SLAM with a LiDAR camera fusion with optimal performance, precise calibration must be guaranteed between the two sensors. An extrinsic calibration is needed to determine the relative transformation between the cameras and LiDAR. For this purpose, the extended Kalman filter can be modified to integrate such fusion of sensors, leading to improvement in SLAM accuracy. For the rover's autonomous navigation, we have used the ROS navigation stack with a few modifications. The navigation stack consists of four major components, namely mapping, localization, odometry, and planning. Mapping and localization are done by using an RGBD SLAM algorithm, which utilizes the point cloud and visual features from the RGB camera, as well as laser scan from the LiDAR. This creates a map of the terrain, which is used by the path plan. The odometry from the rover is fused using the extended Kalman filter, while the visual inertial odometry from the RGB camera is used by the navigation stack for an, extent, for, for an accurate reading. Global path planning is done using A star algorithm, while local path planning is done using DW. The map generated is used for generating cost maps along with processed odometry information. The algorithm does the path planning when given a goal and package publishes it on the velocity controller of the rover, thus mobilizing it. For the autonomous manipulation of the arm, we have decided on using the MOVE framework provided by Ross. The MOVE group mode is the heart of the MOVE framework. It is the central node that communicates with all the sensors and actuators associated with the arm. When the 3D coordinate is given to move it, the path planning phase is set into motion. It consists of using the open motion planning library along with RRT algorithm to generate a safe path for the robotic arm to trace. The inverse kinematics are calculated by the planner and the resultant joint configurations are given to the joint controllers by the MOVE group node to actuate the arm. Now hand, handing over the science section to Niharika. A drill is installed in clo close proximity to the science lab of the rover and is fitted with the necessary equipment. The drill sucks the subsurface soil that is present below and will also gather samples from its crevices and excavate the hole. Cameras are installed on the lab's upper surface to monitor the meticulous execution of the activity and to ensure that the samples are moved correctly. A semi-permeable locking barrier will be used to transfer the collected material to the in-situ science analysis facility. 
This will guarantee that the samples are completely uncontaminated. The sample will undergo a number of examinations before going on to more sophisticated elements like the spectrometer, which will aid in the identification of the mineralogy and primarily aid in determining the biological potential of the soil. We will now begin with the mission analysis. In the first mission, the expedition is concerned with what has been discovered in the southern polar cap region. A few features such as minerals whose presence is due to residual erosion in the geological past are recognized through analysis and research based on historical and contemporary occurrences. The distinctiveness of this area is determined by the channels or valleys as well as the minerals and gases that are found there and contribute to the presence of microbial life and the possibility of habitability. The second mission is concerned with going across various regions of the area with the assistance of cameras and data from motion sensors, which will help in smooth movement with few obstructions. The rover has a suspension built in to help it navigate through rough terrain and the differential ensures stability to the chassis. The SLAM method is used for mapping, while a modified Ross navigation stack is used for navigation. In the third mission, the soil samples are collected by the drill on the robotic arm and are transported to the science lab. It ensures that the samples collected are uncontaminated during the transport for efficient conduction of chemical tests. The following analysis will take place on the rover with the help of specific tools and equipment like various sensors. A few chemical tests like the chlorate and protein test will be performed to confirm the existence and habitability of microbial life. For the fourth mission, the robotic arm has a three-finger gripper for the collection of regolith samples. The soil and rock samples are collected from areas of scientific interest. After the analysis of the soil and rock material, the region shows a majority of polar ice caps covered by CO2 frost. The biological potential of the soil can be ensured by fertilizing the Martian soil. Finally, the X-ray diffractor at the top of the robotic arm enables rapid identification of different mineral compositions in the soil sample. Research during the fifth mission shows that the region is heavily characterized by ice largely made up of CO2 and craters that could be rich in water. The region is also characterized by a lot of unique formations that are brought on by CO2 gas blowing dust at specific periods of time and is said to have depressions that resemble lakes on Earth. In the last mission, salt lakes that were originally covered by ice are a prominent attribute. The region of Planum Austral has characteristics that mimic the Antarctic ice sheet. It is also said to have four seasons with varying temperatures that consequently change the saturation levels in the atmosphere. Dust devils are also a likely occurrence in this region. The habitability factor of the region can be determined by conducting a few tests which could indicate whether or not bioorganisms exist and if a particular area in the region would be suitable enough for an organism to survive in. We would now like to conclude our presentation by offering a big thank you to the Space Robotic Society for hosting the International Rover Design Challenge and providing us with an opportunity to present our work on a global platform. We are now open to questions. Hi uh, guys, uh, an audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, I'd just like to go a little bit more deeper into how we're going about uh, the autonomous navigation. So uh, you had mentioned the ROS navigation stack and all of that. So can we just go deeper into what exactly is the approach? Because yeah, the ROS navigation stack uh, operates predominantly for maybe skid steer robots and uh, uh, all of them, right? So, but have you written any uh, custom stuff over that? How, how is it? Can you just go deeper into what all you're using exactly? Uh, and even the sensors, I, I'm not sure what you're using for the uh, point cloud data. Yeah? Uh, okay, so I'll be answering that question. Uh, okay. So when you're talking about navigation in general, uh, it is predominantly divided into mapping, localization, odometry, and path planning. Uh, so when we are talking about mapping, uh, mapping as well as localization will be done by SLAM. Now we approach, now there are two ways to perform SLAM. Uh, when we are talking, uh, it is visual SLAM as well as LIDAR SLAM. Now we analyze the pros and cons of both. Uh, and we came to a conclusion that, uh, like we read a couple of papers and we came to a conclusion uh, that visual LIDAR SLAM uh, perf performs much better uh, and provides a much better accuracy uh, with respect to mapping as well as localization. Uh, now, in order to perform a visual LIDAR SLAM, we need to perform an extrinsic calibration of sorts. Uh, in order to make sure uh, key, the transformation between the two sensors is uh, proper. Uh, this can be done by modifying the extended calibration filter. 
uh, now when we are talking about odometry uh, we will be uh, taking odometry from uh, so just, just before devices. we go to odometry just before we go to odometry why yes. uh, did you also find an answer as to why exactly visual lidar slam is better you said you identified it's better but what are the specific reasons why it is better uh, reason being ki there are a couple of uh, uh, like reason being like there are couple of pros and cons regarding both uh, like when we are talking about uh, uh, visual slam uh, like it has uh, like it takes a huge amount of data but we get uh, data from multiple angles uh, while we are talking about lidar it is much more accurate uh, regarding as well as uh, has a better range well range really doesn't matter here but uh, has a uh, much more uh, accurate uh, data in general uh, now when uh, we combine these things uh, uh, it has been uh, noticed ki uh, the data that we get uh, the uh, what the output that we get is much more accurate uh, with respect to slam okay but uh, do you know the specific reasons as to why it is like that uh, and what kind of lidar and what kind of cameras are we using like what uh, is the so, specification of the lidar and uh, the camera the lidar uh, and camera both are custom made uh, but when we are talking about the camera in general uh, it is uh, on the basis of uh, like it is designed by taking multi sense uh, camera designed by cmu university uh, as an uh, what do we call uh, example of sorts or is it monocular uh, it is an rgb uh, so is it is it stereo or is it monocular uh, it is stereo okay and uh, and uh, when you go to lidar so if you're saying it's custom so what what are the specifications and why do you need that uh, because a lidar working in outdoor requires something yeah now when we are yeah now when we are talking about lidar uh, we like we have taken belodyne as an example uh, like when we approach this uh, we really didn't want to uh, uh, do it like we didn't want to uh, uh, buy uh, pre made products uh, we thought like uh, we as a team uh, thought ki uh, in a few years the development and uh, the development phase of each and every uh, sensors uh, would be a bit better and we took those uh, things into consideration uh, before actually uh, proposing uh, lidar and stereo together no but what, what so if you're designing your own thing you would need some specification right like i need the resolution to be this much i need this much field of view i need this angle uh, then there has to be like a specification right like if you're making your own thing uh, you're adding more variables to your design yeah uh, yes uh, like uh, as long as i remember the specification with respect to lidar uh, we uh, took uh, like we had a degree of free, like a uh, field of view when you are talking about it was around uh, 120 degrees uh, and we were using uh, uh, one main lidar as well as one main stereo cameras uh, one main stereo camera uh, now apart from that uh, some spec- like apart from that like, uh, what about the back back of the rover and uh, what about like say you want to make a turn um, how do you know uh, that what's happening yeah, we, on the uh, side uh, yes we have a couple more cameras uh, like on the mast cam as well as on uh, what do you call has cams uh, as well as we do have a couple of more lidars when i'm talking with respect to the uh, navigation we have a main uh, system of sorts we'll be using those as well but uh, when we are talking about sole navigation uh, we'll be considering two as the main sensors got it and how many of these would be there totally on the rover and where are the locations uh now locations i think uh, vedangi will uh, confirm but uh, there are uh, four uh, 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 main look like we have uh, on uh, like on the mast cam like we have mast cam we have has cams uh, uh, mom can you take it to that slide as well uh, but you told me you are using a stereo camera right so your mast cam and your has cam is not going to be stereo camera that's frank uh, yes yes like uh, yeah it's going to be a nav cam yeah uh so, so what are you uh, for navig i'm talking about like the depth sensing camera and all of that uh, what are the locations yeah. how are you going over that so your mass cam is primarily probably going to help you with some science task probably or with uh, you know tele operation maybe uh, but uh, for navigation specifically to generate your point cloud and all of that um, what is the, what is the full approach uh for regarding this uh, vedangi will take over okay so uh, uh there are uh, two stereo cameras and two depth sensing cameras and uh, 
like so, one stereo so camera. you're using so then why, if you're using what what's the difference between the depth sensing camera and the stereo camera like see, stereo cameras are usually used for the depth sensing right because you have two monocular cameras that is working like a right to give you the depth perception so what's the difference between your depth sensing camera and your stereo camera in terms of hardware okay so uh, basically uh, the depth sensing uh, in depth sensing camera it is actually used for um, what do you say? Uh, it is actually used for uh, detail ma mapping, like for uh, soil analysis. We need a close up uh, and a more clear yeah, picture. I'm not worried about soil and all that. I'm just asking about your autonomous navigation. Uh, I'm not worried about your soil uh, or any of those things for this question, at least, right? So, just for your autonomous navigation, what are your sensors? Uh, if you guys don't have the idea about it, fine, then we can proceed to the next question. Uh, but yeah, just give me a yes or no that, okay, this is what you're going to do, or we don't know what they're going to do. Uh, when we are talking about autonomous navigation, uh, like we have one main RGB and one main uh, like one main uh, lidar camera. Uh, so, sorry, one main lidar. Uh, now, uh, uh, like apart from that, we have a lot of other cameras as well uh, mounted on uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, like a has cam as a uh, mask cam. Now, when you are talking about depth sensing cam, there, there is also a camera mounted on the arm itself. Uh, what do we call uh, to perform? Uh, uh, like in order for us to perform. Uh, uh, Path planning in general, even in ARM, uh, when we are using Movit, uh, we need uh, to have, uh, like, we are using uh, multiple algorithms. So we need to have, uh, we need to take uh, collision elements into consideration. Uh, we need to create a map as well. Uh, we need to create an Octo map. And in order for us to do so, uh, we would need a depth cam there as well. But when we are talking with respect to navigation, uh, there are other cams as well. But one, like, we have a LiDAR. And we have a stereo, uh, like we have a RGB camera, uh, it, which is stereo, obviously, uh, and uh, which will be mainly used for navigation. Okay, and what, where are these placed? Because because in the design, you guys didn't mention that, uh, and even here, I don't see like your cameras. You mentioned depth sensing camera. If you can go to either autonomous navigation slide for the sensors that you're using, uh, we can just because yeah, I didn't see that explicitly in your report as well. Um, and uh, that is an important component about what you're exactly using, right? Because otherwise, uh, how are you navigating? So then there's no point of the, the how, how will the machine progress? Either you should say that, okay, we're teleoperating using the mass camera and as cam, and they're not like using any autonomy. Uh, and, or, or we go with, if you've entered autonomy and you're using LiDAR and all that, then we have to have like a proper answer, right? Otherwise, yeah. Uh, so we'll be placing the stereo camera under the mask cam, uh, and when you are talking about lidar, it will be placed uh, on the uh, uh, top of the chassis itself, uh, where we have enough uh, 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 view so that uh, the lidar is moving clear. Okay, and so that's going yeah. to be like you said, it's only a one twenty degree field of view, right? Uh, yeah, we'll be having uh, multiple lidar, but when we are talking about when the rover itself is moving forward. Uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, like these two main, uh, like camera as well as LIDAR will be working as a main function for navigation as such. Okay. And, and what about your like uh, drive system? Uh, how are you guys, uh, going about, uh, uh, any backup systems in case, like say your middle wheel fails or like, what, what's the total weight of the rover? Uh, the total weight of the rover is a thousand kilograms. Thousand kilograms. And, uh, what is the, uh, power each? motor is consuming and what is the torque rating for each motor? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, each motor will be working on a uh, 12 volt, uh, this, and, uh, it will be consuming a power of uh, 25 watt and, uh, 25 watt, uh, one second, two motors at once. So, uh, 14 watt each. Yeah. You are, how, how, so you're saying it's a total 12 volt, uh, you are and carrying a payload of 1000 kilos, right? I mean, your yeah. rover weight is 1000 kilos. Um, you might maybe just check. Uh, I don't think that's practically possible for you guys to operate at 12 volt and 25 watt, which is like hardly two amps of current per motor. Uh, yeah, because of the, because of the yeah, so because of the RPM is uh, way too less, uh, we do not uh, require the uh, RPM values, so we cannot, uh, we can uh, increase the torque. Uh, so what, what, uh, is the torque, what is the torque estimated for each motor? Yeah, so the torque is around uh, 1800 kg centimeter uh, per motor. And uh, we have uh, taken into consideration some motors which are actually available in the uh, 
market but then we are not uh, again uh, uh, taking them uh, just putting them directly we have uh, taken into consideration the uh, effects that can be measured and uh, taking into consideration the futuristic uh, developments uh, we have put our uh, specification according to what uh, power uh, we had calculated yeah so so maybe your 1800 kg cm is probably closer to reality but your 1800 kg cm is not achievable with 25 watts at all like you're off by like not even like uh, one or one x or two x it's off by like at least 50 x so probably just just uh, recalculate that but yeah uh, from my side i'm done apart from that okay okay we'll surely look into it okay. i have a science question so uh, i see that you have uh, mentioned chemical tests uh, in the report and you're using spectrometer to uh, like analyze that. So uh, first of all, uh, do you think the Bradford's assay will be sensitive enough to look for proteins? Uh, or so, hmm. uh, yeah. so I'll be answering that. So yes, the Bradford assay uh, test is uh, totally dependent on an indicator and the amount of amino acids present there. So depending on the bonding with the dye, uh, the in the color change happens. So yes, there might be false positive. So that, uh, but other than that, when the uh, normal sample is being tested, we could analyze the individual constituent elements through a spectrometer. Okay, uh, so I see that you are using a spectrometer to look at the Bradford's uh, test results, right? Uh, yes, sir, but individually also. Like, uh, we for the change in color, we have cams, uh, we have a camera inside the uh, science lab to observe the change in color from brown to blue, indicating whether the protein test is successful or not. So if there's a false positive, uh, then we proceed to the, uh, and if we have a doubt, then we proceed towards the spectrometer. So the same, uh, uh, so, like regulate sample that has been introduced in the Bradford's reagent goes for spectrometry? Uh, no, sir. Uh, the uncontaminated uh, sample, which has not been tested by the Bradford test, can be tested for uh, uh, amino acids specifically. And any idea uh, like how much nanogram of protein or milligram of protein your uh, Bradford's assay can check, uh, like detect? I'll have to look into that soon. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think I'm uh, done with this. Thank you. Uh, I just have one question regarding uh, the communication module. You are using a 900 megahertz and 400 megahertz frequency uh, for communicating, right? Yes, sir. So uh, have you checked whether these frequency are suitable for the environment at Mars? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, the 400 megahertz uh, uh, frequency is being used for UHF antenna and it is already it has already been used in previous missions and also that the satellite at uh, which it is going to, uh, going to communicate, it is also at similar frequency. So therefore the transmission and uh, reception is going to be easy with, th with those satellites. And coming on... Coming on to the uh, 900 megahertz, um, we have seen modules which are capable enough to communicate at that particular distance that is of 20 kilometers. And our module is uh, easily going to communicate at that distance with 900 megahertz being small, having greater wavelength uh, than 2.4 and 5, it is easily going to uh, penetrate through obstacles to reach that particular distance. Okay, uh, my second question is regarding the use of uh, satellite navigation for your task. Uh, why? Uh, what exactly was the motivation behind going for the satellite navigation or uh, using the satellite imagery for identification? Uh, because that will uh, increase the cost of the mission, uh, I suppose. Uh, yes, uh, like uh, at one point we were considering that if we would have more satellites, we could use GPS itself. But at that point, that really didn't seem feasible. Uh, so, uh, like if we do have a satellite, our approach was that we could use satellite imagery to actually uh, create a data set in in which we could uh, what we call find areas of scientific importance, uh, which in turn could help us uh, traverse uh, the uh, traverse the uh, Mars yard basically much more uh, efficiently and uh, we uh, and the chances of us missing uh, something during the mission uh, would decrease significantly as compared to uh, if you would have done uh, 
done it like uh, without uh, satellite images. Okay, but as far as I remember, for the IRDC competition, this competition, the location was already specified in the rule book. Uh, you had a specific uh, location where which was to be analyzed, and you could have uh, probably used uh, the navigation, the different modules, the cameras or sensors on board the rover itself to identify the appropriate location or the best site in that range. So uh, if I'm limiting the range, let's say I'm saying that I have a, uh, let's say 10 kilometer across 20 kilometer area, uh, why do I need to go with the satellite navigation? Uh, our motivation behind it uh, was key. It could even serve uh, like uh, first and foremost, uh, our motivation behind it was key. It could uh, help us in the initial planning of the mission as well. Uh, first and foremost, uh, like uh, apart from that, uh, what do we call on board? Like supposedly, uh, on board cameras get uh, uh, what do we call damaged as well. Unlikely, but uh, because we have multiple backups. But if uh, by certain chance we are not able to what do we call uh, detect uh, landforms as such, we can still uh, continue on with the mission like at least to detect tough landform that, that are visible through the satellite. We can uh, do so and continue to a certain extent. Okay, thank you. That's it from my side. Thank you. If anyone else so, has no question, any questions, I just have one quick general feedback gauge. Like uh, for the next time, right? Unless you're extremely sure about something that you're using on your rover, it's better not to mention it, right? It's just better to record be 100% sure with everything that you guys are talking about so that you're not under the uh, radar later on, yeah? Yes, sir. Yeah. We'll surely we'll take care about it. Yes, yes. Otherwise, yeah, good presentation. Good, good, uh, good effort for the first time, yeah. Great. Yeah, so overall, we are quite satisfied with the performance and this was your first time. There are certain teams which already have some advantage. They have been participating in this kind of competition for the past two years. And interestingly, we have observed that even the teams which perform really good in field events, whether it's IRC, ERC, URC, or ARC. So even those teams have found it difficult because it's uh, ha it has completely different problem statement. So there yeah, are conclusions for, you know, building this thing up and uh, this is your first time. So we hope that you still continue to participate in the coming editions and uh, we want to see you more open. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, providing such a, providing us with such an opportunity to think over stuff, which uh, maybe any other uh, competition will not uh, help us to because uh, making a rover on earth and making an actual, designing an actual rover which can work on Mars actually gives us a lot of experience. So we are very grateful for the experience that you have provided us and uh, we'll surely be uh, attempting all the com uh, competitions from SPRS and uh, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. you please leave thank now. You, thank, you, thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, hello everyone, I'm audible to you all. Uh, yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah, so the next team today, which we have, is a, a team Chris Robotics. They are from yes, Chris Pilani. And uh, I still remember I got a call from them like two years back when they were starting. And now they are uh, particip participating in the competition for the first time. So, before we move to the presentation, let me remind you the guidelines you will have 16 minutes to present your design and after that you will have 15 minutes to uh, for the q and a session during the presentation four of you can speak and during the q and a session all 10 of you can take part in that so whenever you are ready please start with your presentation sure sir thank you Uh, I hope the presentation is visible to everyone. It is. A very good evening to our esteemed panel of judges. We are Team Chris Robotics, and this is our presentation for the final round of International Rover Design Challenge 2022. Team Chris Robotics is a newly established technical and robotics team at Bits Pilani, Pilani Campus. 
Our team consists of 57 passionate members from various backgrounds who have been divided into the domains of software, electrical, mechanical, science, and management. Talking about our approach to this competition, we needed to come up with a robust mission plan, which would work in tandem with our rover design and make the most of the given problem statement. First and foremost, based on our research of the Martian South Pole, we took cognizance of our surroundings. The location was already specified to be Planum, Australia, from 74 to 77 degrees south. We chose our time of operation to fall in the month of the summers in the Southern Hemisphere. The duration of this mission was of 20, 20 hours. Martian South Pole displays dry ice and water ice in stratified arrangement, which makes it a very good preserver of geological, mineralogical, chemical, and potentially even biological history, which makes this region that of high interest for scientists. Due to the harsh and unforgiving conditions, we also needed to fully understand what we would be dealing with. Hence, the following major environmental conditions were taken into consideration. The temperature at Martian South Pole is known to drop as low as minus 140 degrees Celsius. And the terrain can be quite undulating with steep slopes and uh, with steep slopes and low traction, especially on ice. The solar irradiance on Mars is very low, making solar panels less useful, especially at the poles where the sun is closer to the horizon. Due to high wind speeds, dust storms can be quite a menace, particularly because of the light and fine dust which can damage our electronics. As a broad overview of our mission, we have defined three modes of operation for the rover. In the locomotion mode, the rover would be traveling with its passive sensors turned on, looking for interesting sites at this uh, ice and soil interface with the aid of its camera. If a site of interest is detected, the rover would then uh, activate its uh, other sensors, cameras, and ground, ground penetrating radar. The helicopter will also take its flight. Based on the output from these sensors, the rover would then decide whether collecting a soil or ice sample is worth it or not, and to carry it back to the base station or perform an in situ analysis. Next, we will took a, took a, uh, let's, we'll take a broad look at some of the salient features of a mechanical design. For a smooth and reliable ride, suspension is of great importance. At first, we decided to go with the rocker bogey mechanism, but that didn't satisfy our quest for the ultimate suspension. Hence, after a lot of research on multi-body dynamics, we sought to use a four-bar mechanism instead of the conventional rockers. This is called the Chebyshev lambda linkage. The material of choice was titanium aluminum vanadium alloy that shows high strength even at very low temperatures. Here is one of the many simulations that we performed to validate our designs. As you can see, we have designed our terrain with certain uh, features that might simulate what the Martian terrain might look like. And you can see that the links are performing very well. Uh, for the wheels, we plan to make use of special shape memory alloy of copper, nickel, and aluminum, the working temperature of which is way below minus 150 degrees C, making it elastic and not brittle even at such low temperatures. With spike grouses, good traction is ensured, and the entire assembly then becomes an empirical optimization condition between the hysteresis loss in the wheels and the traction. Fully covered floating axle titanium hubs are used to prevent motors from getting damaged from dust or jerks. Now taking inspiration from Ingenuity, a helicopter was designed for aerial surveillance of the topography as well as the atmospheric analysis. Due to low atmospheric density, the propellers need to rotate at very high speeds of up to 2500 RPM to generate enough lift. Our six degree of freedom robotic arm has been designed keeping in mind the versatility, accuracy and serviceability. The arm has a union docking mechanism for interchangeable end effectors, making it able to perform many different tasks, such as picking and placing samples back into the rover's body. This uh, brings to the conclusion of a mechanical design. Now we move on to the electrical design. Listed in this slide are the problems the electrical team had to tackle. We shall go over them one by one. Let's start with powers. We explored multiple routes for powering the rover. However, not all were feasible. Some were too heavy, some couldn't provide sufficient power, and some were still in the early research stage. After much research, thermoacoustic power converters, namely TAPCs, proved to be a good solution. The logic behind the TAPC is straightforward. Radioisotopes are used to generate heat. The heat is converted into electrical energy using an engine and an alternator. A general purpose heat source, or the GPHS, uses polonium-210 instead of conventional plutonium, since polonium packs more energy into less mass. 
A Stirling heat engine is used to convert the heat into mechanical power and a magnet restrictive alternator further converts it into AC power. While exploring options for the helicopter's power system, weight posed a severe constraint. To keep it to a minimum, we decided to use simple lithium ion batteries on board. Since omission is in the frigid polar regions, conventional silicon based semiconductors will not suffice. We proposed the usage of gallium nitride or GAN based semiconductors. Owing to its high band gap and lattice structure, GAN provides high electron mobilities over a wide range of temperatures. We can also operate the circuits at significantly higher frequencies safely. The heat release will also help us maintain the electronics at more favorable temperatures. There will be significant heat losses during the mission. An intricate thermal management system was created to make sure all components are kept in favorable condition. The GPHS provides heat in the right amounts to the different parts of the rover, and the aerogel and gold coatings help retain the heat. Controlled vents were also added in case the system ever overheats. Regular motors would suffer from demagnetization uh, issues at lower temperatures. Magnetic materials often undergo changes in lattice structure as the temperature decreases. Hence, we propose to build custom brushless DC motors using permanent magnets made of neodymium iron boron. Molybdenum disulfide lubricants would also be required to reduce losses through friction. Embedded systems are the electronic backbone of the rover as they form the control network. All alternators and motors are controlled via this. An adaptive PID-based control system is employed. Rigorous models of the different components are used to select appropriate PID coefficients based on pressure, temperature, and other operating conditions. Sparking poses a serious threat since sparks can fry our electronic systems. Hence, electrostatic discharge mechanisms are crucial. However, since Martian soil isn't conducting, grounding will not work as it does on Earth. Ironically, the best discharge path happens to be through the air. We create these paths by ionizing the air using americium-241. Needles are mounted around the rover wherever discharge is critical. The rover is capable of autonomous operation. Hence, only an emergency satellite communication link was designed between the rover and the base station. A communication link between the rover and, heli and the helicopter is also needed to get data like the camera feed. For this, we propose to use a simple Wi-Fi communication protocol. This brings the electrical design part to an end. Let's now see the science mechanisms. The science module's failure was, was designed to test uh, the sample site and its environment. To characterize the atmosphere, we have a climate station which has sensors for dust, wind velocity, pressure, relative humidity, temperature, radiation, and magnetometer. When it comes, the magnetometer is, is, is important because when it comes to uh, when it comes to determining the, the methane concentration, the concentration of, of, of different compounds in the atmosphere is de determined by the sample analysis module, which uh, which which takes in air using uh, using its atmospheric inlets. It is also it also takes in solid samples and and takes uh, uh, in, in, uh, um, into the sample manipulation system. Part of it is uh, is kept is kept for testing at the base station. Another part of it is kept for testing at uh, testing on Earth, and the rest of it is put into is put into pyrolysis ovens. These ovens release the volatiles. These um, the, the, these volatile gases are uh, are sent to are sent to the to, to the three sub instruments within the within sample analysis module, which is the which is the gas chromatograph, uh, which uh, which helps to identify the different substances present within these gases. The tunable laser spectrometer which can apply precise isotope ratios for carbon and oxygen in carbon dioxide and measures trace levels of other gases uh, which are which are important for life such as methane, water, and it also it also specifies their carbon isotopes or hydrogen isotopes. The, the mass spectrometer is also used for definitive identification of organic compounds. The panoramic camera is a uh, the panoramic camera is a high resolution stereo pair of wide range um, uh, 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 wide angle cameras with uh, with uh, with a multi spectral uh, filter wheel each of eleven filters each. It also has one it also has one high resolution long distance camera, uh, but. Uh, to better map, uh, um, uh, to better map of uh, uh, distances which are far away, uh, the the supercam houses most of the instruments for for spectroscopy, which is, is essential when it comes to characterizing uh, characterizing the elements we are looking at. Um, uh, time resolved Raman luminescence visible and infrared reflectance spectroscopy take care of mineralogy and molecular structure analysis because they are of key importance 
to uh, uh, to uh, to seeing what uh, to seeing what is there in, within a sample. Um, uh, in addition, we also have laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, which will be used more sparingly as it is destructive testing. It is used only only in cases when we need to know the elemental composition of a rock, and 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 and, and are unable to do so using SAM. A microphone is also used to measure the pressure wave produced by LIBS. And we also have, finally, we have a color remote microimaging unit, which uh, 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 which is uh, which is better giving us better giving us high resolution images of the site on which the spectroscopy uh, spectroscopy is conducted. Finally, we have the ground penetrating radar, which is used to uh, which is used to characterize the subsurface structures non intrusively. The information it provides is very helpful for, for putting the readings from all the other instruments into context. Uh, whatever uh, whatever instruments. Uh, uh, whatever instruments we, we wanted to use, but were not able to use uh, uh, due to the due to the infeasibility of size constraints or the delicacy of the test, we uh, 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 we have said that we will we will include them in the base station. This this includes the X-ray diffraction, which gives us the structure of the molecule, uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, which, uh, which 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 tells us which organic compound is present within the sample. Uh, uh, along with uh, along with a modified RT PCR similar to that which was conducted in the test of Viking one and two, we, uh, uh, it's better because it, it tests for RNA, which is more primitive than DNA. And uh, and 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 um, uh, conducting this test in the presence of uh, of a radio of a radioactive carbon source allows us to to confirm that life exists. Uh, last but not least, we have electronic spectroscopy, which is the most delicate which is the most delicate spectroscopy available. It is used to detect environmental contamination from Earth. And this and, and this ensures that our readings are accurate. Hi, I'll be presenting the rules of me systems. We will use stereo cameras and lidar for computer vision and depth perception. We will use we'll also use multiple cameras around the rover, which both look at the ground and some that look at the horizon. The ones looking at the ground will be useful for reliable visual odometry, while the ones looking at the horizon will be useful to take images of the surroundings track key objects and features. The IMU and wheel encoders will help with collecting data for odometry. The onboard computer will be based on a jets on a modified Jetson or an AGX. It will be customized with appropriate semiconductors and tuned especially for the requirements of the rover's hardware, such as simultaneously dealing with multiple camera feeds and sensors. It will also have CUDA and tensor cores for AI and vision acceleration. For software, we will be relying on ROS2 and NAV2, which are a lot more reliable than ROS1 and NAVSTAT. They're also much more customizable and well-structured. Since we have an ORN HEX, we'll be able to parallelize much of our code and optimize it for NVIDIA's architecture when needed and possible. It's possible to implement SLAM and CV in OpenCV, AI in PyTorch, and even general arithmetic using CUPI or CUDA C++ for CUDA and thus optimize and parallelize these algorithms on the GPU. ROS2 and NAV2 are very well supported in Python as well as C++. Typically, computer vision and path planning libraries get better support in C++, while AI gets better support in Python. And thus, the two languages will be used in programming the code for the rover. We will further use AI to optimize our algorithms and bring better real-world performance. Speaking about the AI, real-world sensors have non-NARTs and uncertainties, which are difficult or non-trivial to correct. AI uses data and experience to process high density, high dimensionality, multimodal data to understand these uncertainties, nonlinearities, and the subtleties of the real world. Computer vision algorithms see countless benefits of deep learning. We shall apply it to 3D structure and depth estimation, scene segmentation, obstacle detection, and also use it in conjunction with the RL algorithms for faster scene interpretation and state estimation. Navigation can be improved using reinforcement learning. We can train models to control the rover optimally and efficiently and safely across uncertain and rugged terrain. We train our RL algorithms by bootstrapping them with some kind of mathematical models which are already known and which are typically a good and safe start off point. And then we train them on Earth, firstly in simulation and then in physical environments like the MDRS or Antarctica to learn how to correct errors in sensor data based on the rover state. The rover, the rover has the following aspects of navigation. The rover will traverse the path optimally by using sensor fusion data for smooth navigation. The navigation will be based on local planning and control, and the rover will hold low density maps to keep track of its traverse path. It will be able to autonomously navigate around obstacles and travel to identified regions of interest. But how will it find these regions of interest? So it will identify regions of interest based on few sensor data from cameras and other scientific sensors. We will use random walks to localize these regions of interest and see how the data from these sensors changes 
as as the rover moves in different directions finally the ai will be tested and it will be restricted to behave within controllable parameters for the safety and reliability of the rover that ends the presentation for chris robotics thank you everyone Yeah. Uh, hi, Rana. Audible? Okay, you were even going. No problem. You can go first. I'm doing it. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, nice presentation. Um, my first question will be about wheels. Uh, you used mesh wheels in the rover. Uh, did you analyze what will happen uh, if it will pass through some regolith and it will fill the interior of the wheel? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, since we are mostly traveling over uh, what seems to be the interface between ice as well as soil, uh, there are a few dust as well as ice particles that might be uh, that might be uh, trapped within the wheel. But since this is just a 20-hour, uh, this is just a 20-hour mission, we don't we have a feeling that the weight that might be trapped within the wheel won't be of much significance. Uh, of course, if this was a long-term mission, this would have been a much bigger problem. Uh, okay, and uh, another question is about um, interchangeable end effectors. Uh, what will happen if the dust or Martian regolith will contaminate docking mechanism? Uh, did you analyze that? Yeah, so the mechanism for the inter interchangeable end effectors is separate from the gripper part and the driller part. So it is not affecting the, con it, the contamination cannot happen in the mechanism when, when the driller part is being used or then the gripper is being used. The, that's why the, it won't affect when we are analyzing and we are drilling through regulus or using the gripper. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all from me. So yeah, hi guys. Uh, good presentation, but uh, I just had like a couple of questions. Uh, first one was uh, with respect to your CAD, at least uh, at least from uh, to the naked eye, right? Uh, what is the workspace of your robotic arm? Because it doesn't seem to be long enough to even maybe reach the ground or according to the ground clearance that you have for your rover or reach your uh, any, you know, access any I don't know where you're swapping it exactly from where your module to swap the gripper is, but I, you can just clarify that with dimensions uh, based on your ground clearance and the mounting point of your gripper uh, of your robotic arm. Is it like long enough to reach the ground and you know do your uh, analysis? Yeah, so so can you still probably just share the dimensions exactly uh, from CAD or you know if you have something accessible, that would be great. Yeah, so I think we cannot share the CAD right now, but uh, mm -hmm. we've checked and it is it's in it's a 6 of arm and there are mm -hmm. four links. So we, we have enough length to access. Uh, we so have what is the workspace to, of the arm? The workspace of the arm is in the front of the rover and it can go a bit to the side. Dimensions. Side. Dimensions. Dimensions. Uh, I'm not because you guys seem to have done like a good job with the inverse kinematics and all that. So I'm assuming you'd have proper workspace calculations, right? So. Uh, okay. Right, uh, I do have the dimensions. Am I allowed to answer this question? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. Right, so uh, our design, our design of the robotic arm was uh, the workspace was designed to be around 1.2 to 1.3 meters, uh, okay. depending on what is the uh, what is the end effector. And it's a very retractable arm. Uh, we designed it to be very retractable so that it can be positioned uh, in a very compact way, which is why it appears small. But when it completely unfolds, the workspace extends until 1.2 to 1.3 meters. Okay, so and, and what is the ground clearance of your rover? The ground clearance is kept to be around 50 centimeters. 50 centimeters? Yeah. And uh, then what, what is the dimension of your wheel? Uh, the wheel dimensions we have kept to be around 20 centimeters, uh, the diameter. Okay. Um, so if your wheel dimension is 20 centimeter, I'm not exactly sure if your ground clearance is 50 because uh, your wheel seems proportionately smaller uh, than. Okay, just just keep that in mind. Just probably review that once uh, because right, the right. mounting point of your arm and uh, reaching any kind of payloads in the bottom. Uh, I mean, any kind of analysis that you want to do in the bottom doesn't seem even even fully extended with 1.2 meter. I'm not really sure. That right. is one thing. And the next thing is, uh, I think I, I didn't catch it in the presentation or I missed it. Uh, how is your uh, helicopter being powered? 
the helicopter is being uh, the helicopter is being powered uh, via lithium ion batteries that are on board the helicopter itself okay and what is the run time for that uh, it's 30 seconds of uh, 30 seconds of flights for nine mm -hmm. flights 30 seconds flight for uh, nine flights and recharging is happening on the rover yeah uh, the lithium ions have been placed such that it will suffice the uh, nine flights. Okay, and um, what all? What is the exact? If you could just go to the helicopter slide, I just, I just. Uh, it's it's loads. in, it's on the screen. Okay, got it. And and what are the payloads that the helicopter is carrying? So, what is the exact purpose of the helicopter? Uh, uh, so the helicopter has been designed to carry uh, a camera. Okay. With three different filters. So instead of using three different cameras, we'd be using three different filters for the camera, which would uh, take the uh, images of the topography. Okay. And apart from that, it is also carrying uh, atmospheric analysis sensors, very small sensors, which are not very big in size uh, okay. to measure the atmospheric conditions. So, so with that camera and with that sensor, what, what are you trying to extract exactly? Uh, with a 30 second flight, I'm assuming you'd be able to cover maybe like, you know, 30 second front and back, 15, 15 seconds, maybe about like a Two three meter radius, uh, right? Uh, so what 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 is the what what is the right. plan with the data that you are getting, and uh, what is the use of the data from the camera? Right. So uh, so I'll I'll explain the uh, the flight mechanics. Basically, yeah, yeah. The, the, it is designed it is designed to uh, go not very high, about uh, two two stories high uh, mm -hmm. at the max. And uh, since uh, the atmospheric density is very low, so we don't have a lot of control on the uh, yaw or roll. Uh, mm -hmm. On the on the different modes that it can travel, so it's most res uh, restricted to vertical flight only. Lateral flight is not uh, very; uh, uh, it it cannot be achieved. So, uh, uh, and as far as what the data will help, uh, what the data that is gathered by the helicopter will help us, uh, Joshua will explain that part. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, um, we always um, 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 we uh, we always should fly a drone once we found an area of high interest. And it, um, um, uh, uh, when when we say an area of high interest, it should have a couple of parameters. Um, um, we uh, we will be looking for we will be looking for uh, for anomalous readings when it comes to the methane concentration, when it comes to the magnetic field strength, and when it comes to uh, 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 and when it comes to the results we gain from 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 from, from the from the spectroscopy. The reason um um um. Uh, the reason that we particularly are asked uh, for the for the drone in this area is we um, uh, we want to see uh, we we want to see um, um, uh, how does it vary uh, with, with with respect to its um, 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 uh, uh, how do these things vary such as the radiation the the dust present um, 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 the the CO two O two and methane concentration how does it vary with respect to height in an area because uh, because because as we know um, uh, Mars has an issue of having a localized magnetic magnetic crust but so when, uh, so, when, uh, so, when, so, when we, so so we posited that that life is more likely to be found in these areas as methane breaks down when it is not being protected by the magnetic field. So, uh, so, so, so when it comes to areas of high interest, uh, we have decided to uh, uh, to take spectral images of the entire area as well as characterizing what it is, looks like. Um, 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 uh, is, it, is it is it a cave or uh, is it a large grotto that has been that is that is being uh, she, uh, that is being sheltered from the radiation? Uh, uh, could there be a reason for these anomalous readings? So, so, so the drone is uh, the drone helps uh, put our readings into context for the, the science mechanism. Okay, and and uh, with the camera specifically, uh, I didn't get that. But what, what are you doing with the camera specifically? Like, is it a front-facing camera? Is it like a downward-facing camera? What what kind of? It is. Uh, 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 it is facing downwards. Okay. And it has. But and it has overlap with uh, the. If it's only able to uh, operate vertically, then won't it overlap with whatever the rover is seeing? Uh, or like, why is there need for the camera? Just... Um, 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 the rover is restricted to seeing what it can from its angle. However, uh, um, 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 uh, additionally, uh, uh, which, we, which, we, which we cannot traverse to due to due to difficulties in the incline, the um, uh, uh, we can we, we can come nearby and fly a drone. So this allows us to supersede this. Uh, this allows us to supersede this problem. And so there's, uh, and there's no like la there's no like transverse moment, right? There's only like altitude motion from the helicopter so in that case how is it helping with uh... um 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 i suppose that we'll try to come as close as possible and then fly but i think utank would be able to explain this 
so regarding the question about the downward cameras, uh, basically it will help uh, uh, on on in such a terrain where it it is mostly uncharted. Uh, we do we might come across large cliffs or areas on there on which there are large drops. So uh, when when we are using uh, our stereo cameras or the lidar for the terrain mapping, we might not be able to see very far. Whereas in, in case we do have a camera, it also helps with the uh, autonomous travel uh, of the uh, of the rover because we have a very uh, good vantage point for the topography. I mean, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. But my only concern here is like all three of you have given me different uh, answers. Like uh, the first answer was that you're only having a downward facing camera and the helicopter can only move right. uh, vertically, right? And then now you're saying that you're trying to cover uh, all. I mean, uh Explore areas, right? Uh, no, no, like there's no, that's not much lateral movement. We are relying on the field of view of the camera. Okay, got it. And then, yeah. like my last question would be, uh, in terms of the power calculations, right? Can we go a little bit more uh, deeper? Can you guys just explain how did you come up with uh, one? Yeah, the 390 watts for the helicopter, and as well as the overall rover. What's the total power consumption, and uh, uh, how have you gone about that? Uh, so uh, for the power calculations, uh, let's start with the rover. For rover calculations, um, let, I'll bring up the slide. Mm -hmm. uh, here, so a total of, uh, we calculated a total of 570 watts was required. Approximately 360 watts was uh, dedicated to the mo uh, drive motors. Okay. The six motors that we have. Then there was just, just uh, software. Computer, what is the uh, weight of the rover overall? Uh, so the weight, expected weight of the rover is uh, to be around 750 kilograms. 750 kilograms. Okay. Um, I, and what is the torque on each uh, motor, drive motor? So we're expecting... Uh, if, we, if we do consider the factor of safety, we're expecting it to be around uh, 4 uh, Newton meters per beat. Okay. Yeah. So I think yeah, now that makes sense because for, for a payload of 750 kilograms, uh, 570 watt is not going to be enough, uh, and if you in four newton meter is definitely not uh, going to suffice at all. Uh, so then yeah, then when you calculate from there, 570 watt makes sense. But uh, but yeah, but then you guys have to probably revisit your uh, design in terms of your drive system. Um, yeah, if you, if you for 750 kilogram, uh, four newton meter is like barely anything considering the Martian terrain. Uh, you are, you are dealing with more slippery environment. Any inclines are going to be more difficult and you're having spokes to overcome it and all that, you need like much more torque. Uh, so yeah, so probably just, just go over your calculations uh, a bit more. Um, even even on mass setting, I think, uh, yeah, 570 watt and then, yeah, then go from there, like so 360 watt for the drive and the remaining ones are going to? Uh, software is uh, approximately uh, 100 watts. Uh, mm -hmm. like 90 to 100 watts science mm -hmm. is similar to software only and there's this emergency communication uh, wherein there's 20 watts okay. uh, so as you mentioned about this power being uh, more if uh, if required the power system that we have used in tapc can be stacked up and can be magnified uh, to that extent. Uh, you you broke there a little bit sorry I lost you there in between. Okay, uh, you said that uh, 570 watts uh, might not suffice. So, um, if upon calculations the energy requirements do come higher, we can uh, magnify the TAPC's um, TAPC's power output. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, the components of it, so we can just improve it. Okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. Just quick feedback is that a little bit more. Uh, depth in everything that you guys are putting would be really appreciated. Uh, otherwise, I think yeah, for, for your first design, I think it's it's uh, pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a short question. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so it might be similar with the previous one, but uh, could you give me more details about your uh, stress expectations, calculations on your suspensions, like specifically for the uh, rear back of the mechanism? And what is your approach to dealing with it in case of like Martian terrain? Right. So uh, since the gravity on Mars is lower, so we do expect it to have uh, uh, lower stresses. Uh, we did run a few uh, tests on uh, static structural analysis. 
and uh, the I, I we don't have the figures in this presentation and i don't remember them but uh, we we did consider a good factor of safety uh, and in the case of for example uh, the same analysis was even conducted on the robotic arm and uh, even uh, so uh, those uh, analysis have been added at the end of our report in the appendix section and uh, yeah this the similar analysis was done on the suspension and everything came out to be uh, in the safe category uh, so uh, you don't ex expect any problems possible problems for the shear stress let's say uh, uh we uh, on the rear suspension you are asking yeah uh, no so we don't expect uh, shear stresses on the uh, on the rear uh, suspension Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a question for you. So how much area do you plan to cover during those 20 hours? Uh, so when we did, uh, when we took the uh, data from uh, various satellites, low orbiting satellites on the Martian South Pole, we came to find out that the uh, land, the distance was around 100 to uh, uh, 120 to 180 kilometers when we traverse in the uh, in that 74 to 77 degrees south location uh, but during the 20 hours it wouldn't have been possible so we try we are trying to cover uh, a, a circular path so that uh, the point that we start at we eventually come come back to the same point by the end of the 20 hours okay so how much area is that like some so, estimation uh, or if you exclude the external factors like physical factors Suppose uh, it's a plain a, area. Right, sir. Uh, in, in case if it's a, it's a it's a good surrounding and combining the uh, time taken for our flight, uh, helicopter flight and the other tests, we expect to uh, cover a distance of around 20 to 25 kilometers. Okay. And uh, I'm, I just want to know, like, which is the most unique or innovative system which we have included, any component or any process which we have used, right, like... Uh, on which you have sir, spent most time uh, sir i think we can name uh, a couple of things for example in the suspension uh, we we modified the rocker bogey suspension with the chebyshev's double lambda linkage uh, it's a four bar mechanism which is designed to uh, basically uh, reduce the reduce the height of the apparent center of rotation of the front rocker uh, front rockers which we think is a very good uh, it showed very good results when we did the simulation and we also had research backing this. Uh, this was one area where uh, where we think we did a good job. The second would be regarding the uh, calculations for the thermal losses, heat losses in Martian atmosphere. Since we don't have a very good idea about the uh, convective convective losses on Mars, so uh, we did extensive research on that as well. So okay, and uh, how much time did this entire project take? So we, we started with this project around uh, 25 days ago. Okay. And how much time did the presentation to take? Like uh, Just the presentation, sir. Uh, yeah. So with the presentation, we started, uh, we started preparing it around uh, three days ago. Okay. So yeah, that's it from my side. Is there anyone else to, who wants to ask a question? Uh, sir, uh, sir, 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 this, not, this might not be the most effort reported, but, uh, but, but, I, but like, I did find uh, one. Uh, I did find something. Um, I, I had an idea. Uh, son, uh, son, son, um, uh, in, in 1976, uh, uh, NASA sent its Viking 1 and 2, and they, um, um, uh, and they had a label release experiment where they, uh, where, where they took a sample and they kept a neutral, so, uh, a neutral solution, al uh, um, uh, and they kept a neutral solution along with some radioactive carbon. Um, they then, uh, they, they, they then tested the atmosphere within the experiment for carbon. This showed up as negative, and the, uh, and um, um, this showed up as positive. However, there, there is still contention among scientists uh, um, uh, as to the results. As uh, as the person who made the experiment claims that it is it was proof life existed. Uh, um, while uh, while uh, while his colleagues were not uh, were not willing to put their weight behind those words. Uh, um, uh, an idea I had was. Um, um, uh, if you conduct the same experiment now, but um, 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 but you use RT-PCR, which would be uh, which would be better, uh, which would be 
uh, which would be better for such an experiment, um, uh, which is which is aimed at which aimed at amplification of the target um, uh, of the target substance uh, to, to to identify. Um, um, uh, it would uh, it would give us much better results. And uh, and seeing as uh, seeing as the pandemic we have has has greatly increased our technology, greatly increased our knowledge of this technology. I do think that it would be very helpful if we do ever plan to actually go and search on Mars in this way. Yeah, so guys, so that's it. And uh, it was good to have you participating for the first time. And we hope that you continue to participate in upcoming competitions as well. And uh, I like the presentation. And being a first time team in the competition, that's uh, really good. And if I compare IIDC with other competitions, it's uh, kind of unconventional if I see. It. So it's difficult uh, to make the entire project within this uh, short span of 25 days. Next time we plan to increase that uh, time, we plan a window of 90 days uh, so that uh, teams have enough time and uh, they don't uh, find it difficult because some teams, they have their exams in between, so they don't get much time. So that is the plan. So yeah, with this, we conclude the three- Thank you so much. Thank you so much. IRC Thank finals. You. And uh, I hope to see all of you competing next year as well. And as far as the results are concerned, the results will be declared uh, next Sunday. And uh, after that, I think it will take two weeks uh, for you to get the certificates. So all the best to all of you. And we'll also be sending all the comments and remarks from the judges end to you uh, through email. So whatever you get in that, so try to improve on those points. So that the mistakes which you have done this year, you, don't repeat those mistakes. And uh, over the past three days, I have uh, been just you know noting down all the comments and uh, remarks from judges. So there are few things which I see in particular. The first thing is a lot of teams they had a really good design everything, but they lacked the approach. They did not have clarity what they want to do, what they want to explore there. Uh, they just simply it looks like that they have fixed the wheels and the rover they have built. That's it. Second thing is. In IRDC, especially, we are changing the place, the location, each year. Last year, it was lower tubes. This year, it is South Pole, the area near the South Pole. So the first thing which your astrobiology or science team should do is you should observe what the area is. Because when we talk about the field competitions, we don't see those kind of things. We just build a rover to win a competition. And to be honest, that's just a terrestrial rover. We hardly consider anything much in that. So I think that should be the second thing. In third team, certain teams, they still had that uh, budget in the mind. They went with the, you know, mostly inexpensive things. They don't want to spend anything. Here, it's a virtual competition. So that the biggest advantage is that you don't have any constraints on your financial resources. You can spend any amount. So you can spend trillions. So no issue. So be creative. Spend, uh, you know, some time figuring out the things which you generally don't use. And most importantly, it is always better, like in my opinion, to build a new structure completely and don't uh, upgrade your existing rover for IRC or some other competition. Because I've seen the teams which win the competition in the past two years, they are the team which generally build a completely new platform because the problem statement changes entirely. And I know this thing that the rover which you're building, you can't take this to IRC directly, but certain elements of IRDC will be taken into IRC as well in coming years. So what we were doing last year, that thing might come in IRC after two years or three years. So that is the plan. So the progress has to be gradual. So yeah, with this, uh, I would like to conclude this uh, three days of finals. Thank you very much to all the judges, all the participating teams. And we hope to see so many other competitions like this in the coming future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.